This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome to the seventh compilation of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who viewing figures. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future installments and check out our previous compilations. We've covered the first six Doctor's eras, but for now, sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who viewing figures. Our destination? The Seventh Doctor's Era. It's early 1987, and the Doctor Who production office has a crisis on its hands. After John Nathan Turner was instructed by the BBC higher-ups to produce the forthcoming season 24, he was left without any scripts, a script editor, and most importantly, a new Doctor. The previous incarnation of the Time Lord, Colin Baker, had his time in the role cut mercilessly short by the powers that be, who believed that for the show to be a success once again, it needed a new Doctor. Refusing to take part in a regeneration sequence, JNT had to work fast to not only cast the seventh Doctor, but also amass together a season of stories to show them off to an eager fanbase. His choice was the Scotsman, Sylvester McCoy. Initially finding fame in the Ken Campbell Roadshow and children's programs such as Vision On and Eureka, McCoy was a man of many talents, talents that JNT believed would be perfectly suited to the role of the Doctor. In the story department, the new script editor in town was Andrew Cartmel, a relative newcomer to the industry, taking over from Eric Saywood, whose very public resignation had left a sour taste in the mouth of the producer. Cartmel wanted to reinvigorate the programme, and had big ideas that he wanted to set into motion, commissioning newer, younger writers whom he felt not only understood the show, but offered new and exciting ways to tell a story. With just 14 episodes allocated to the season, Cartmel and his team were able to craft four brand new adventures, all very different, and in different respects, all equally memorable. With the new Doctor set to pilot the TARDIS and the scripts being locked in, season 24 was ready to go. But as with the beginning of every new era, the question was asked. Would the public take to this new Doctor? Would they enjoy the new stories and the various directions that they wish to head in? And perhaps most importantly, particularly for the BBC, would this new lease of life cause the viewing figures to shoot back up to the levels that Doctor Who had become oh so accustomed to? Or would they remain as low as they did the previous year, or even worse, decline even further? Let's dive right into season 24 and find out whether the show's last chance saloon paid off. The first story from season 24 is Time and the Rani. The TARDIS is forced down on the planet Lakertia by the Rani, where the Doctor regenerates into his seventh body. Masquerading as Mel, the Rani tricks the Doctor into helping her further her plans to take control of the universe. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 7th of September, 1987, and concluded on the 28th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and I think it's fair to say that this is not the sort of comeback that the programme was hoping for. Despite the higher-ups demand of a new Doctor, it seems relatively few new audience members were all that interested, as the opening episode only attracted 5.1 million viewers. This sort of figure echoes what happened during the trial saga the previous year, and the following three episodes only continue to do so, as all of them fall below 5 million, attaining 4.2, 4.3, and 4.9 million viewers respectively. These are some of the lowest numbers that Doctor Who has ever pulled in during its time on air so far, and considering the series was seemingly now always one step away from cancellation, it's hardly reassuring. For the top 40 TV programs, however, things are slightly more positive, in the sense that none of Time and the Rani's four installments dropped out of the top 100. Part 1 charted the highest at 71st, still a fair way from the top 40, but somewhat of a saving grace at this point. Part 3 slips 10 places lower to 81st, Part 2 further still at 85th, and Part 4 is the lowest charter, finishing up at 86th place. So even though Doctor Who managed to kick off its 24th season within the top 100, the ever-present distance from the top 40 makes that sort of honour seem ever more elusive. What exactly happened here then? After a change in Doctor, change in script editor and several other factors, why was Time and the Rani not able to bring about the ratings boost that the higher-ups, and indeed the production team, had hoped for. Well, before we address our regular factors, we must note the fact that Doctor Who was once again shifted around in the TV schedules. The series was to no longer occupy its traditional Saturday tea time slot, for it would now air on Monday evenings. The programme was no stranger to weekday airings. The entire Peter Davison era went out twice weekly to sustain success, so what was the difference here? Well, during the Davison years, the programme was airing either just before or at 7pm against consistent competition. 
but competition it could often claim victory over. However, for season 24, Doctor Who would now air at 7.35pm, the latest time the show had ever gone out in its history so far. This move prompted some complaints from parents whose younger ones could no longer watch the show due to clashes with after-school activities, or in some cases, had already gone to bed. However, the main problem with this new time slot was the competition shown over at ITV. For now, the Doctor would go directly up against the network's longest-running soap opera, Coronation Street, which had been on air since 1960. As with most soaps, Corey would see peaks and troughs with its popularity over the years, but with a sensationalist rise in storylines hitting most soaps of the late 80s, the public was more interested as to what was happening on the cobbles than ever. Against Time and the Rani, ITV soap was easily able to attract more than double the Doctor's viewership week after week. BBC One controller Michael Grade defended this schedule change, claiming that with some of Britain's biggest names appearing this season, he was confident that it will make inroads into the viewership on Monday evenings. Sadly, in Time and the Rani's case, these hopes were disastrously unfounded. What about the promotional department, though? Was a lack of publicity another damning factor into the weak impact that the season opener had? I'd argue no, as there was a startling amount of publicity for Time and the Rani, just not all of it good. On the positive, a trailer was screened at a BBC press launch in mid-August, which showed clips from the first three stories of season 24, as well as highlighting several of the guest stars that were set to appear. A cut-down version of the trailer was later screened on BBC One to advertise the new run of adventures. In the print world, Doctor Who enjoyed some lavish colour promotion thanks to publications such as the Radio Times, who dedicated their back page spread to the upcoming season, and Sylvester McCoy was the subject of several interviews, as were his co-stars Bonnie Langford and the returning villainess Kate O'Mara. All of this positive coverage seemed to occur before the broadcast of Time and the Rani, for as the serial hit the airwaves in September, that's when all of the negative comments came in. Many of the tabloids criticised the new Doctor, the story, and the series itself. Several cited the adventurous pantomime in tone, with the lead actors camping up their roles to the max. Within the fandom, several were critical of the programme, with even the Doctor Who Appreciation Society voicing their disdain at producer John Nathan Turner, with many blaming him for the show's supposed decline in quality. This continued the strained relationship JNT had with the fandom, as whilst he knew attending conventions and events was a great way to build that bridge, he was growing weary of the ever-constant scathing attacks on his work and his character. Meanwhile, the viewpoints of the general audience continue to flood in. A programme to show these opinions, points of view, showcased some comments from viewers regarding the serial. Some were enthusiastic, others were outraged. Nice to see that hasn't changed over the years. The new theme tune that accompanied the new titles also drew heavy criticism. Arranged by Kef McCulloch, the new theme had heavy synthesizer overtones that many believed removed the air of mystery from Ron Grainer and Delia Darbish's original. However, I couldn't disagree more. I feel this theme gives off a sense of excitement, wonder, a slight tinge of menace, it feels like a full package, and to this day, it remains my favourite iteration of the iconic theme. But perhaps the piece of publicity that was the most telling of how divisive the new Doctor and Adventure were was the appearance of Sylvester McCoy, Bonnie Langford and John Nathan Turner on an edition of Open Air. Broadcast live one day after Time and the Rani concluded, the stars and producer endured the scathing comments made about their performances from the press and the disdain from viewers regarding the show's supposed descent into pantomime. The three take most of these on the chin, and some positive comments were made which is a nice silver lining, but perhaps most reassuring was JNT confirming that there would indeed be a new season for 1988, so at least viewers knew season 25 was locked in. Time and the Rani had a rocky ride of it to say the least. From derision in the press to criticism from viewers, you could be led to believe that simply no one enjoyed the serial, or the new Doctor. But of course, this simply isn't true. Even back in 1987, there were those in the print world and on TV expressing their admiration and enjoyment of the season opener. And while Sylvester's Doctor was still finding his feet, there were those who enjoyed the clown-like antics of this impish new man. Regarding the story itself, it's often chided as being one of the weakest examples of Doctor Who that's ever been, and sure, there are moments that feel a tad bit panto, some elements that look a bit flimsy or unfinished, but honestly, for the most part, I find Time and the Rani a lot of fun to go back to. It's crystal clear that the cast are having the time of their lives making this show, particularly Kate O'Mara, who returns as the Rani. Having found success overseas in hit show Dynasty, Kate insisted that she would be more than happy to return to the muddy quarries of Doctor Who to record a return appearance. The story was written by Pip and Jane Baker, an established writing duo who had previously penned The Mark of the Rani and five episodes of The Trial of a Time Lord Saga. And whilst many cite this as their weakest effort, you can hardly blame them for trying. 
considering that when they wrote the serial, they still had Colin Baker in mind as the Doctor, as well as alterations being made at the request of new script editor, Andrew Cartmel. The result may be a little over the top and a tad ridiculous in places, but Time of the Rani boasts some new and impressive special effects for the time, some wonderful scenes with Sylvester as the Seventh Doctor, and just a prevailing sense of fun and frivolity that provides some of the most entertaining Who of the 1980s. Highly recommend you give it a chance. Just switch your brain off and have a blast. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.6 million viewers, a 0.3 drop from the previous story, that being the 14-part Trial of a Time Lord. This is hardly the average you want to clock in for a season opener, especially one that's introducing a brand new Doctor. This figure makes Time and the Rani the least viewed post-regeneration story for a new Doctor on our journey thus far. A disappointing sight to say the least. A new Doctor had proven to be event television for the audience, curious to see the new lead in action and how they'd adapt to the role. And whilst Part 1 had a small boost, it seems that intrigue was nowhere near at the levels it had once been amongst the general public. It may all seem like doom and gloom, but I can't stress enough how much fun Time and the Rani is. I appreciate that it may not be for everyone, but at a time when Doctor Who was constantly facing calls of cancellation, not just from the press but even in some corners of the fandom, the fact that this serial wasn't afraid to let its hair down and present a story filled to the brim with wacky ideas and set pieces, that's an admirable cause to take in my opinion. To join in the fun for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1987 or its forthcoming audio adaptation, which will be released in 2022. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1995, the standalone DVD release from 2010, or the Season 24 collection set from 2021, which is exclusive to Blu-ray and features Time and the Rani alongside the three other stories from this run. Whether you're in it for the Rani's return or to see the Seventh Doctor's first moments, Time and the Rani holds a lot of intrigue within its four episodes. It may not be the finest example of Doctor Who ever made, but it certainly captures the sense of spirit and optimism that the show had been championing for the last 24 years. Just don't let a tet trap get its tongue on you. That's just a little weird. The second story from season 24 is Paradise Towers. Arriving in Paradise Towers, the Doctor and Mel find that the high-rise apartment block fails to live up to its name. Warring gangs battle it out in the corridors, murderous cleaning robots are on the prowl, and something sinister is hidden in the basement. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 5th of October, 1987, and concluded on the 26th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and we seem to have improved slightly, but not to a high enough level for the show to be considered overtly successful in the ratings department. Whereas Time and the Rani had three episodes attract less than 5 million viewers, Paradise Towers manages to do the opposite, with parts 2, 3, and 4 breaking that barrier. Just. The peak viewership of 5.2 million with part 2 is a new high for season 24, but when compared to the past 23 seasons, it's a far cry from the show's past success. Part 1 stands out with only 4.5 million viewers tuning in, showing that despite all the efforts the production team were going to to reinvigorate Doctor Who, they were largely going unchecked by the UK audience. However, looking over at the top 40 programmes, Doctor Who once again was able to avoid slipping into triple digits, with all four parts holding firm within the top 100. Part 3 ranks the highest at 79th, whilst parts 1 and 2 slip lower at 88th and 84th respectively, and part 4 comes the closest to slipping below 100th, as it settles in at 93rd place. Not bad for a show that was currently struggling to hold a viewership of over 5 million viewers. So, it seems that Paradise Towers couldn't provide a big enough boost to the show's vastly reduced viewership. But what factors were at play to result in this? It should come as no surprise that the competition over at ITV was arguably the dominating factor that contributed to Paradise Towers' low results. Coronation Street continued to demolish Doctor Who in the Monday night schedules, with the soap consistently getting well over 10 million viewers with each instalment. However, not to be outdone by immense odds, the promotional drive for Paradise Towers was consistent in both the print world and on TV. The focus of the promotion was the appearance of guest star Richard Briers, who was playing the leading villain, the chief caretaker. Briers was somewhat of a household name in British TV, his most notable role arguably being Tom Good, the leading man in popular 70s sitcom The Good Life. His appearance, along with the story, was promoted extensively on TV. Aside from the series launch trailers, Briers popped up in clips that were previewed on programmes such as Open Air, teasing his appearance, as well as the presence of the sinister cleaner robots. The Radio Times included several monochrome photos of Briars in character to help promote Part 1, and in the Today publication, 
an interview with the star was published, in which he discussed his role as the chief caretaker, and his thoughts on Doctor Who in general. One bit of odd publicity came from everyone's favourite dish rag, The Sun, in which they erroneously reported that the show had been axed completely. This came on the day of part 1's broadcast, and was far from true, with producer John Nathan Turner having confirmed that the show would return in 1988 the previous week. Also circulating around the press at this time was the prospect of a big budget Doctor Who movie. Unlike the cancellation rumour, JNT was all too happy to indulge this story, with him claiming that a film was being made by Coast to Coast and would be released in November 1988. Fair to say, this never came to fruition, and the idea of a Doctor Who movie would be a prospect that would last way into the 1990s. As Paradise Towers went to air, one key bit of positive feedback came from head of drama, Jonathan Powell. Writing to the production office, he described the serial as first rate, and even suggested a future storyline involving the Daleks at Paradise Towers. Now, that's a sequel I'd be interested in seeing. The general reaction to the story was far more positive than with Time and the Rani, with audiences enjoying the atmospheric nature of the complex and the inhabitants within. However, one scene drew heavy complaints, namely the sequence in which Mel is threatened by the elderly Rezies, who brandish knives towards her. Doctor Who was no stranger to knives or just violence generally, but wider events could have contributed to the complaints. The Hungerford Massacre, in which 15 people were brutally murdered by a man with legally licensed weapons, had occurred in the August of 1987. From this event, a careful control was maintained regarding violence on British television. Despite being approved before transmission, Michael Grade found this scene to be a step too far and instructed John Nathan Turner to tone it down for overseas sales or repeat transmissions. From this, several shots were cut from the scene to avoid focus on the knives themselves. However, when issued to home video, the original scene was retained and has done in every subsequent release. Paradise Tower stands as a shining example of the fresh new direction that script editor Andrew Cartmel wished to take the programme. The sets are atmospheric and dingy, the supporting Kangs are interesting and fleshed out, their presence and role within the towers told wonderfully through the dialogue and the set pieces. The chief caretaker and his cronies, whilst having a delightful air of camp, do a great job of providing the menace for the serial, as do the aforementioned Rezies, their gleeful delight at capturing Mel sending shivers down the spine. The cleaning robots perhaps may have been more effective in lower lighting, but their inclusion is welcome nonetheless. And there's Pex. Who could forget Pex? Obviously fashioned as a pastiche, Howard Cook does a great job at making him both appear arrogant and cocky, but also sympathetic and likeable. And all of these elements were crafted by relative newcomer Stephen Wyatt. Commissioned by Andrew Cartmel, Stephen relished the chance to develop a script for the programme and was generally pleased with the finished result. It wouldn't be long before his name would appear in the opening credits again for a similarly dark and creepy tale. But more on that when we get there. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.9 million viewers, a 0.3 increase from the previous story. It's a small improvement, but an improvement nonetheless. However, it is a shame that pulling in less than 5 million viewers, which was once a one-off, is now becoming worryingly more of a regular fixture for the programme. But people seem to take to Paradise Towers a little more than Time in the Rani, and we can only hope this positive trend continues as Season 24 progresses on. Paradise Towers can arguably serve as another turning point in the programme's long history. It marks the first script that Andrew Cartmel was able to properly commission, catering to his vision for the programme and establishing new talent within the TV landscape. It marks a more atmospheric look for Doctor Who in terms of its storytelling, while still retaining a warmth and light touch to the proceedings. If you dare to explore the depths of Paradise Towers for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1988 or its audio adaptation from 2012. To watch it, you have the 1995 VHS release, the 2011 standalone DVD release, or via the Season 24 collection set, which is only available on Blu-ray. If the wacky antics of Time and the Rani weren't for you, then you may get a lot more from watching Paradise Towers. Sure, there's still some wacky moments to be had, but it's a wonderful adventure that is filled with danger, high stakes, and some truly standout moments. Take a trip yourself. Just watch out for those cleaners, otherwise you may end up as a meal for something sinister. We're cleaners! Back to the list! Wait, don't turn back! The third and penultimate story from season 24 is Delta and the Bannermen. Joining a group of alien tourists for an unplanned stop at a 1950s holiday camp in Wales, the Doctor and Mel discover that one of the holidaymakers is being pursued by the ruthless Gavrock and his Bannermen, who are determined to make her race extinct. 
This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 2nd of November, 1987, and concluded on the 16th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and for the first time in season 24, we have a story in which all of its episodes pulled in over 5 million viewers. Part 1 kicks things off with 5.3 million, the highest of the season so far. Part 2 drops slightly to 5.1, but then Part 3 brings things back up and provides the new top showing for season 24 thus far, with 5.4 million sitting down to watch events conclude at the Shangri-La holiday camp. Despite hovering around 5 million being seen as a disappointment in the bigger picture, it is reassuring to see that the viewing figures are increasing, no matter how small the jump may be. In regards to the top 40 programs, as you may have expected, no episode is able to crack that top bracket. However, for the third time this year, Doctor Who managed to avoid falling out of the top 100, with all three of Delta and the Bannerman's episodes finding a place within the chart, though not by much. Part 3 is the highest charter, at 87th, but parts 1 and 2 came quite close to slipping to the next lower level, as they charted at 90th and 93rd place respectively. So, if Delta and the Bannermen currently represents the peak in Season 24's viewership, how come it wasn't able to push its numbers up even higher? ITV continued to dominate the Monday evening slot with Coronation Street, the ongoing events on the cobbles proving irresistible to the viewing public. I just want to take a moment to bring up the notion of recording programmes. I've mentioned it before, but as the 1980s progressed, VCRs were becoming more of a household staple rather than a luxury novelty. And even though more viewers recorded programmes year on year, Doctor Who included, these recorded viewings were not considered for the ratings. So, whilst I'm sure many fans tape Doctor Who whilst they or their families watch Corrie, it would be the soap that would climb higher in the ratings table. But whilst the TARDIS team's fight against the crew from the rowers' return seemed to grow ever more impossible, publicity and promotion for the series continued to remain consistent and plentiful. For Delta and the Bannermen, it was one of three Season 24 stories that was briefly showcased in the trailer for the programme. A week before the new season started, it was the subject of a five-minute item on But First, This, which interviewed Sylvester McCoy, Bonnie Langford, and guest star Ken Dodd from the set of Delta and the Bannermen. The comedian's appearance was one of the most highly promoted items for Doctor Who that year, given his status as not just a household name, but a first-class entertainer. The Radio Times dedicated a colour article to Dodd's appearance, and trailers aired before transmission often show clips featuring his Tollmaster character. The publicity and hype for his appearance perhaps implied he would feature throughout the story, when in fact he is mercilessly killed off during part one, much to the joy of some of the tabloid reviewers. The press reaction overall to Delta wasn't particularly positive, and some areas of fandom were much different. During an episode of BBC Two programme Did You See, which aired days after Delta concluded, former unofficial continuity advisor to the show, Ian Levine, and Doctor Who historian Jeremy Bentham were featured in interviews in which they criticised the programme, particularly how it was being handled by John Nathan Turner. The producer came under further fire from one of the leading Doctor Who fanzines, Doctor Who Bulletin, in which it claimed many of its readers and viewers overall wanted Michael Gray to fire John Nathan Turner and get a new producer for the programme. Whilst JNT had been in the producer's chair for seven years by this point, already becoming the longest serving, he certainly was still trying to maintain the series' presence on air, even if he desperately wanted to move on to other projects himself. Delta and the Bannermen may be remembered for its very light-hearted and campy overtones, but by god is it a great time. Similar to Time and the Rani, which was widely criticised for feeling like an overblown pantomime, Delta embodies that same sense of fun and adventure. It has some great gags from many of the guest stars, and the setting of a rundown Welsh holiday camp I feel strangely works for this story. The whole 1950s theming works a treat in both the visuals and the music, and even if the main story can get lost within it sometimes, it's still a serial I can return to that's guaranteed to put a smile on my face. The writer for this story was Malcolm Cole, yet another newcomer to the programme brought on by Andrew Cartmel. Whilst it may have seemed quite out there and unusual for Doctor Who at this time, I find in retrospect Malcolm's work to wonderfully blend the fun, light-hearted nature of the setting and characters with the bleakness of the Bannermen and their ruthless leader, Gavrock. As mentioned, even though his time is brief, Ken Dodd is clearly relishing his small role with great gusto, and he too brings a smile to me and many fans who enjoy the story today. As does Stubby K, a Broadway legend who may not have much of an idea of what's going on, but the effort he gives the part makes it all the more endearing and enjoyable. The final supporting character I want to give praise to is Ray, a lovely Welsh girl who could have easily joined the TARDIS team as a travelling companion. Her performance in Delta is one of the story's highlights, and it's such a shame we haven't seen her return on TV. If you're not a fan of these sort of ultra light hearted adventures, then perhaps Delta and the Bannermen isn't for you, but like all Who stories, I would always recommend sitting down to try it at least once.
Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.3 million viewers, a 0.4 increase from the previous story. We finally cracked the 5 million mark with Season 24. Even though it may not have been by much, things definitely seem to be getting better little by little. Will we see the upward trend continue, and maybe even surpass 6 million with the final story of the season? We'll just have to wait and see. For all the calls of camp and pantomime that this story gets, Delta and the Bannermen arguably remains as the most fun and entertaining adventure that Season 24 has to offer. Given the right mood upon viewing, it can be one of the most heartwarming tales that Classic Who has, or one of the most laborious. It really depends on your tastes. To see where you stand on this divisive adventure, you can read the Target book from 1989, or its audio adaptation from 2017. To watch it, the story was released to VHS in the later years of the range, back in 2001, before making its way to DVD less than a decade later, via a standalone release from 2009. In 2021, it was included as part of the Season 24 collection set, where it can finally be enjoyed on the Blu-ray format. Doo-wop tunes, a Welsh holiday camp, an evil group of killers and a green baby to boot, you really can't ask much more from Delta and the Bannermen, can you? It may not be to everyone's liking, just like any Doctor Who story, but if you want something that can evoke such simple joy and fun, then you hardly can go wrong with this serial. Perhaps on initial broadcast it wasn't what Doctor Who needed at that time, or more like what the audience didn't want at that time, but as it stands, it's a positive example of a show fighting to maintain its place on the air and having the best kind of fun whilst it's at it. Everyone hop aboard, and let's go back to the rock and roll years. Actually, I think I may have gone a little too far. The fourth and final story from season 24 is Dragonfire. Arriving on Iceworld, the Doctor and Mel find themselves teaming up with Glitz and new friend Ace to find the fabled Dragonfire treasure, but the sinister Kane will stop at nothing to find it first. This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 23rd of November, 1987, and concluded on the 7th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and we've got back to being a bit all over the place. Dragonfire wasn't able to hold at least 5 million viewers across each of its episodes, however part 1 does bring in the highest viewership of season 24, with 5.5 million viewers tuning in. Sadly, a chunk of them dropped away the following week, with bang on 5 million tuning in for part 2, and further audience members continued to drop away by the time the story concluded, with just 4.7 million witnessing Mel's departure and Ace coming aboard the TARDIS. Not the strongest figures by any means, but if these ratings from Dragonfire and from Season 24 showcase anything, it's that despite the reduced audience, those who remained were loyal and continued to be captivated by the new Doctor's continued adventures. Crossing over to the Top 40 programs chart, Dragonfire's placings mean that Season 24 as a whole was able to remain within the Top 100 for the duration of its run. Part 1 charted the highest at 80th, and parts 2 and 3 came very close to slipping into triple digits, coming in at 96th and 94th respectively. For Doctor Who to remain consistently within the top 100, despite a vastly reduced audience and immense competition, is certainly respectable at the very least. So, considering that Dragonfire was the finale for season 24, why weren't more audience members tuning in to see how the 7th Doctor's first run of adventures rounded off? The main answer to that would be down to the poor scheduling against ITV. The network saw no reason to change their lineup in terms of what faced Doctor Who, considering that Coronation Street was trouncing it week after week with more than double the viewership. The move to Monday evenings wasn't destined for failure right from the outset, but after being placed against Corrie, that almost seemed to be the death knell. However, once again, publicity and promotion for the series remained as rampant as ever, although this time there were calls for celebrations. The BBC claimed that Dragonfire was the 150th story, which would start transmitting on the 23rd of November, the programme's 24th birthday. This is technically true if you number each of the trial segments from last season as individual stories. However, most consider the trial saga to be one long story, thus making Dragonfire the 147th story to be transmitted instead. But hey, who's counting? Clips from the serial were shown in trailers, and also in other programmes that were interviewing the show's stars. An edition of Going Live on the 14th of November had Sylvester McCoy join the regular hosts, where the infamous Part 1 cliffhanger was shown, but we'll talk more on that in just a moment. In the print world, various publications ran with the 150th story celebrations, and the Radio Times dedicated a lavish colour article for the occasion, giving a little backstory on each of the past six Doctors. The arrival of new companion Ace, played by Sophie Aldred, was picked up by most of the press, and she was set to appear on leading children's programme, Blue Peter. However, this had to be called off due to her prior commitments to fellow children's show, Corners, for which she'd recently started writing for as well. 
However, despite all the excitement around a new companion and the 150th story celebrations, one day before part one was transmitted was when the Did You See segment, which heavily criticised the programme, went out on BBC Two. With high profile fans and historians coming out against the show and its producer, it had the potential to shatter Dragonfire's chances in terms of attracting new viewers. How odd that part one ended up attracting the peak of season 24's viewership, with 5.5 million tuning in. Dragonfire did warrant some complaints during its broadcast, namely for a scene in part three, in which the villain Kane's face seemingly melts before the audience's eyes. It reminds me strongly of a similar scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, but despite it being carried across that Kane was mostly made up of ice, some parents found it a little too much for 7.35 on a Monday evening. However, the most important bit of publicity to come during Dragonfire's time in the spotlight was a comment from head of drama Jonathan Powell, who on the 16th of December had confirmed that the future of Doctor Who is safe, and that he believed that the new leading man was doing a marvellous job. So for those who struggled to believe JNT's comments about a season 25 on open air back in September, it now was set in stone. Doctor Who wasn't cancelled and would be coming back. At least for now. Dragonfire is often cited to be the crowning jewel of season 24, and for many onlookers, it's not hard to see why. It's a story filled with charm, menace, and a growing sense of adventure. We have Sophie Aldred bursting in as the new companion ace, a fiery teenager who isn't afraid to speak her mind, blow things up, and call others out for their misdeeds. In many respects, she was quite unlike any companion that had come before on Doctor Who, and it's no wonder that many writers from the revived series cite Ace as a huge inspiration for how modern day characters are formed and portrayed. We also get a fantastic villain, the Icy Kane, who is played masterfully by Edward Peel. Stylized as some sort of quasi-Nazi-esque general, Peel delivers a performance that not only is memorable, but extremely impactful too. The way he manipulates those around him, only for them to meet their demise at his hand, is a horrific yet excellent piece of storytelling. One of those who fall before him is guest star Patricia Quinn, of Rocky Horror Picture Show fame, and while she gives a great performance, I wish they had given her even more to do. The author of this serial, Ian Briggs, was another newcomer to the program, and someone who had been an avid fan of the show since the 1960s. With his knowledge of the Doctor's past, and a love of sci-fi, his dialogue remains sharp and consistent, and the story beats and structure are fast-paced and engaging. We do have a returning character pop-up, that being Sabalon Glitz, played once again by Tony Selby. Having appeared sporadically through the Trial of a Time Lord saga the previous year, it's a pleasant surprise to see him reappear, but Selby absolutely nails the character, that cockney, Del Boyish type charm coming through in spades. Whilst the story is memorable, it's not always for the best. Part 1's cliffhanger has been the subject of mockery and parody ever since it went out in 1987. We see the Doctor come to a cliff face, to which he decides to climb down, and then realising he doesn't know what to do or where to go next, creating a literal cliffhanger. And whilst it does look odd and certainly makes no sense, I'm sure there'd been more money in the budget or more time in the episodes that this scene could have had a bit more context and come off as a bit less jarring. However, Dragonfire also contains one of my favourite scenes from the McCoy era, that being Mel's departure from the TARDIS at the story's conclusion. Her decision to leave does come rather out of the blue, but the little moment her and the Doctor share in the TARDIS is extremely touching, McCoy getting a real chance to show the more melancholic and mysterious side of his take on the Time Lord. It's a lovely scene, and even if you can't believe that Mel would leave with Glitz of all people, we are left with a brand new companion to join the TARDIS. Someone who brings a youthful energy and presence, and one that would undergo the most radical character development of any classic Who companion. But more on that when we get there. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.1 million viewers, a 0.2 drop from the previous story. It's a shame that the upward trend seen throughout season 24 didn't continue right until the very end, but given all of the factors working against Doctor Who, at this point, to finish off with an average of 5 million is somewhat of a saving grace. They aren't impressive figures, even by 1987 standards, but it continued to showcase that the programme had a loyal following that was willing to stick around despite any changes that may occur along the way. Dragonfire is in many ways one of the more traditional, yet excitingly refreshing stories that came out of late 80s Who. The injection of new writing talent helps make Iceworld and its inhabitants feel detailed and intriguing, and even if the dragon mechanoid looks a bit naff nowadays, we can only imagine what could have been had the programme been given a stronger budget. But if you want to witness all these goings on for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1989 or its audio adaptation from 2019. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1993 or the DVD release from 2012, in which it was bundled with season 25's The Happiness Patrol as part of the Ace Adventures box set. For Blu-ray, you have the season 24 collection set. 
which was released in 2021. You may be in it for Ace's arrival, for Mel's departure, the return of Glitz, or just to see a cracking villain work out his malicious plans, Dragonfire feels familiar, yet new all at the same time. It's certainly a highlight from Season 24, and has so much on offer to grab your attention. Just make sure that if you're going to climb down any cliffs, that you actually have a plan to get out of it. So that's Season 24, the four stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of Part 3 of Dragonfire, Season 24 was brought to an end, concluding a three-month run, comprised of 14 episodes across four stories. Now, let's have a look at the averages for this season. We can see that the winner is Delta and the Bannermen, which had 5.3 million viewers watching on average. Whilst it is good that Doctor Who was cracking the 5 million mark, it continues to cast a dark cloud over the series as a whole, considering that for several years, Doctor Who was gaining averages well over 5 million with every single adventure. The least viewed story of season 24 is the opener, Time and the Rani, which had 4.6 million viewers on average. A result within the 4 million range sets off several alarm bells for sure, but considering it's only 0.7 million behind the winning story, it represents the reduced state Doctor Who was in, in terms of its appeal to the wider general public, and not just the dedicated fanbase. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for season 24 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 5 million viewers. This is a 0.1 increase from the previous season, which sure is an improvement in terms of the raw numbers, but to see such a small rise in what was meant to be yet another bold reinvention of the series is quite disappointing to see. And even though all four stories have viewing figures that are quite similar to one another, despite some sort of consistency, the result clearly shows a weakened presence in the wider world of TV programmes in the UK. When placed alongside the previous 23 seasons, The Seventh Doctor's first run of adventures sadly charts as the second least viewed season of the programme thus far, only slightly ahead of season 23, which remains at last place. The further we journey on, it is a crying shame to see so many seasons from the 1980s occupy these spots in the rankings. We can only hope that with season 25, Doctor Who will finally be able to break free of the bottom five, for which it posted new entries to over the last few years. Season 24, like the season before it, had quite a lot to take on and overcome. It not only had to introduce a brand new Doctor, but it had to introduce viewers to new kinds of stories, ones they weren't necessarily used to, all whilst trying to maintain its success and popularity amongst the viewing public. Now, did it achieve all of these aims? Arguably not. The scheduling against Coronation Street was a huge blow for the programme, immensely preventing it from attaining the viewership it deserved, and the constant attacks from the press and corners of the fandom probably didn't help either. However, when all is said and done, the production team were able to put together and transmit four stories that, if nothing else, all retain that wondrous sense of fun and adventure that Doctor Who has been able to do so well right from its inception all the way up until today. Whether it's the more traditional yet wacky events of Time and the Rani, the rundown complex of Paradise Towers, the fun and frivolity of Delta and the Bannermen, or the icy intrigue held by Dragonfire, Season 24 is not only one of the most varied seasons of Doctor Who, but it's also one of the most fun. And whilst at the time and for many years after it was the subject of derision, in recent years opinions seem to have shifted, with many more citing their appreciation for the season, its leading actors, and the stories themselves. It may all be a bit campy, but Season 24 is the perfect example of shut your brain off entertainment. If you're here for a good time, then it's going to keep you constantly smiling away from start to finish. Sylvester McCoy absolutely shines as the Seventh Doctor in this season too. Sure to start with, perhaps his characterisation comes across as a bit too comical, but when given very little direction, he played to his strengths, so I can't criticise him too harshly for that. But as the season progresses, you can already see glimmers of this more mysterious, darker Doctor, a being that is aware of the powers he holds, and how he can use them to set plans into motion, long before his enemies, or even his friends have clocked on. Andrew Cartmell, as script editor, had huge plans for the character that he wanted to set in motion, and we'll see more of that plan unfold over the next few years. But the primary aim had been achieved, that Doctor Who was safe and would return in the autumn of 1988 for its 25th run of stories. But how would the team celebrate and hype up the 25th anniversary? What did they have in store that would not only entertain existing viewers, but hopefully make great inroads into pulling audiences away from Coronation Street, right back to the adventures of the TARDIS team? The year is 1988, and Doctor Who had entered its 25th anniversary year. The last few seasons have proved to be quite a tumultuous time for the programme, 
After the extended hiatus in 1985, the Rocky Trial Saga of 1986, and the low ratings of 1987, all were casting a cloud of doom and gloom for the Time Lord and his adventures. However, Season 25 had been confirmed early into the Seventh Doctor's run, and given that it marked the programme's silver anniversary, the expectation amongst fans was that all of the stops would be pulled out to mark the occasion, just as it had been for the show's 10th and 20th birthdays. Despite having orchestrated the commercial success that was the 20th anniversary in 1983, producer John Nathan Turner arguably had a bigger task on his hands this time around. Doctor Who's profile amongst the general viewing public had weakened considerably over the last few years, but that wouldn't stop JNT and his team from attempting to celebrate the show's Silver Jubilee in style. Four new stories were lined up for the season, stories that would feature a mix of returning foes and thrilling new villains to go up against the TARDIS team. The team itself would consist of Sylvester McCoy, returning for his second run of adventures as the Seventh Doctor, and Sophie Aldred as his brand new companion, Ace. And it's arguably here in which we really begin to delve into and explore these characters. Gone is the overly comedic tendencies from Season 24, with the Doctor now casting a more mysterious, almost unnerving presence, executing long-held plans all whilst keeping his cards very close to his chest. With Ace, her journey is just beginning, but already in these four stories, we see that she is far more than just another typical companion of the classic series. But even with all of this, even with the promise of returning favourites, even with the exploration of a darker, more mysterious Doctor, would the viewing figures hold up? Would audiences flock back to help celebrate Doctor Who's 25th anniversary, or would the numbers remain low, or even worse, continue to sink to lower depths than ever before? Let's delve right into Season 25 and find out. The first story from Season 25 is Remembrance of the Daleks. Planet Earth, 1963. The Doctor and Ace are caught in the crossfire between two rival Dalek factions searching for the Hand of Omega. The Doctor has a plan, but can he stay one step ahead of his oldest enemies? This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 5th of October, 1988, and concluded on the 26th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this is a noticeable improvement over the previous season. Granted, the numbers are still quite low for 1988 standards, but considering that season 24 struggled to maintain 5 million viewers, to see all four episodes of Remembrance hold within that bracket is reassuring to say the least. Part 1 kicks things off with 5.5 million, matching the most viewed episode from the previous year, and for Part 2 the following week, a few hundred thousand more have joined the proceedings with 5.8 million tuning in to see whether the Doctor was able to escape the hovering Dalek. Part 3 unfortunately drops down to 5.1 million, and Part 4 further still to bang on 5 million. But again, I'm happy to see that for the opening story of the 25th anniversary year, public interest seems to have been pipped somewhat, even if it's only just a slight spike in viewership. For the top 40 TV programmes, Doctor Who sadly wasn't able to triumphantly return to the charts, but all four episodes managed to gain a foothold within the top 100. Parts 1 and 2 draw for peak position, both finishing at 78th place, whilst parts 3 and 4 come dangerously close to triple digits, with part 3 clocking in at 91st and part 4 at 96th. A spot in the top 100 is an achievement, but when you can't crack at least 6 million, the chances of Doctor Who ever returning to settle within the top 40 grow thinner and thinner by the year. With throwbacks to the past, a proper first story for Ace, and the return of some shiny new Daleks, why weren't the viewing figures for Remembrance skyrocketing through the roof? Well, as is fast becoming traditional at this point, Doctor Who was once again moved around in the television schedules in the lead-up to Season 25 starting transmission. The previous year had seen the TARDIS team absolutely obliterated by ITV's Coronation Street, which was routinely bringing in double, if not triple, the viewership that was tuning into BBC One. Doctor Who was moved away from Monday nights, now resting midweek on Wednesdays. However, the time slot of the show, around 7.35pm, was retained, which meant that once again, the Time Lord would be battling the cast of the Cobbles over on Corrie. This decision lends to the theory that higher-ups at the BBC were slowly trying to kill off Doctor Who by placing it against such immeasurable odds in terms of its competition. And in terms of how long it was able to do that for, we'll talk more on that when we get there. One shift that had happened late in the day was the premiere date for season 25. Originally having been scheduled to begin on Wednesday the 7th of September, due to the extensive coverage of the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, numerous changes had to be made by UK broadcasters in order to accommodate this. As a result, Doctor Who was pushed back by four weeks, with Remembrance now beginning on the 5th of October. But even if Season 25 was pushed back, this arguably gave the BBC more time to actively market and promote the programme, certainly if not to celebrate the 25th anniversary year at the very least. The leading element of these celebrations was the release of a special trailer to promote the Silver Anniversary series. 
these featured several clips from season 25 stories, including Remembrance, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, and Silver Nemesis. This trailer also featured some special linking material featuring the Doctor and Ace, and was first seen by the press back in August, and later by the public some months later. As well as a series trailer, Sylvester McCoy made numerous appearances on a variety of programs. These included spots on Breakfast Time, The Clothes Show, and Noel Edmonds' Saturday Roadshow, in which McCoy appeared in character as the Doctor on the Clown Court segment, providing skits between screenings of various outtakes from filming the program. Furthermore, Sylvester had been booked to be the narrator and frontman of a brand new live show aimed at children, What's Your Story? This program built on the choose-your-own-adventure style of storytelling that was somewhat popular in the 1980s, and allowed viewers the unique chance to phone up and help dictate where the story went next. So with the then-current Doctor Who fronting this exciting new program, plus his numerous guest appearances on shows aimed at a wide range of audiences, it's arguable to suggest that Doctor Who's profile amongst the casual viewer base was quite healthy. But it wasn't just the Doctor that was the subject of Season 25's initial promotion, but also the return of his deadliest enemies, the Daleks. The Pepper Pots may not have been seen too much on other programs, but publications such as the Radio Times gave them some decent coverage in the run-up to Remembrance's transmission. Most of the press were a bit kinder to the season opener this time around, praising the impressive storytelling and the return of the Daleks, though not everyone was so kind. Two days after Part 1, comments on the serial were featured on opinion-based program Open Air, in which a variety of comments, both positive and negative, were shared. But Doctor Who was back, with his deadliest enemies leading the charge, and with their popularity still as present as ever, it could be argued that the presence of the Daleks helped the programme receive the little boost in viewership that we see with Remembrance. It may have been outdone threefold by Coronation Street's regular audience of around 15 million, but we have to take the small victories where we can. It is a shame that the programme's viewing figures aren't higher, as Remembrance of the Daleks is not only one of the best stories of the Sylvester McCoy years, but also one of the best Doctor Who stories ever told. It serves as another turning point for the show, one in which the excessive frivolity of the previous year is stripped away, and in its place are some genuinely great moments of character drama, excellent action sequences featuring armies of Daleks, and some wonderful moments for the Seventh Doctor. Moments in which the Master Manipulator begins to show his true power. Moments in which the mystique that McCoy and script editor Andrew Cartmel longed to put back into the programme was beginning to shine through. The writer of this adventure, Ben Aronovich, was new to the writing team, but a Doctor Who fan at heart. And not only does he write the Daleks fantastically, but he's able to portray the leads with a huge degree of depth. Depth that arguably is sometimes not so present in certain classic Who stories. But not only is this story a triumph for the Doctor, but his new companion Ace also gets some great scenes to showcase her personality, and just how different and unique of a companion she was going to be for the programme. Her strong views on certain antiquated values of the 1960s go a long way to influence how the show would portray similar stories in the 21st century, and her hands-on approach, particularly with fighting Daleks, is certainly a highlight too. Talking of Daleks, we get treated to two factions of them this time around. The familiar grey-looking machines with their black and silver supreme are the Renegade faction, whilst the white and gold-plated Daleks returned from the previous outing three years earlier, now slightly modified to what has got to be one of my favourite Dalek designs of all time. These are denoted as the Imperial Daleks, led by a spherical emperor, who is later revealed to be the Dalek creator, Davros. Whilst his presence and influence in the serial remain quite minimal, it's great to see Terry Malloy reprise the role as the malevolent megalomaniac one last time in the classic series. The Dalek action sequences, as mentioned, are excellent, and despite the limited budget, go a long way to make these moments feel exciting and thrilling for those who tune in. And speaking of set pieces, this story marked the very first time that viewers saw a Dalek levitate up a flight of stairs, putting to rest 25 years worth of tired jokes and also arguably giving us one of the show's most surprising and tantalising cliffhangers. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.4 million viewers, a 0.3 increase from the previous story, Season 24's Dragonfire. Whilst it's great to see Doctor Who's viewership increase for the beginning of this new run of adventures, 5.4 million is still leagues away from the numbers that the programme was able to pull in even just a couple of years ago. And even with the popular appeal of the Daleks, for Remembrance to pull in fewer than 6 million viewers is really quite staggering, but perhaps not surprising given what it was up against. Regardless though of how little a splash this serial may have made back in 1988, it didn't take long for fans old and new to sink their teeth into it, and celebrate it for its stellar writing, great supporting characters, and its memorable moments. To experience all of the madness for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2015. To watch it, it was released with The Chase on VHS as part of a limited edition Dalek tin set in 1993 and later as part of the Davros box set from 2001, which was exclusive to WH Smith's 
and also contained the other classic Who stories featuring the Dalek creator. That same year, the story made its way to DVD as a standalone release, and was later re-released several times, first as part of WH Smith's exclusive Dalek Collector's Edition set, and a remastered version appeared on the 2007 Complete Davros Collection, which had a limited print run of copies available. Remembrance also got a special edition 2 disc release on DVD in 2009, correcting past mistakes and adding a whole bunch of new extras. Remembrance of the Daleks still is a great example of the high quality of storytelling Doctor Who can achieve regardless of what any outside factors are placed before it. Lots of Dalek action, lots of great moments for the two leads, a supporting cast who are absolutely wonderful and went on to have their own series of adventures on audio by the way. Just every ingredient thrown into Remembrance, in my view at least, works flawlessly. This is more than just a positive recommendation. I would argue that this is an absolute must watch for anyone who wants to delve into Doctor Who. Period. The second story from season 25 is the Happiness Patrol. The Doctor has heard of something evil on the planet Terra Alpha, and tonight's the night. Dictator Helen A has outlawed sadness, enforcing her rule of law with the Happiness Patrol. Smile or die, the choice is yours. This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 2nd of November, 1988, and concluded on the 16th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and the numbers seem to be slipping slightly. Two thirds of the adventure were able to attract over 5 million viewers, with both parts 1 and 3 drawing in 5.3 million. However, part 2 takes us below the 5 million mark for the first time this season, with 4.6 million tuning in to see the events happening on Terra Alpha. Keep in mind, hovering below or above 5 million was still not the best showing for a program in 1988, especially one that had been on the air for 25 years and had a wide international appeal too. But what about the top 40 programs? Well, for the first time since 1985, Doctor Who fell below the top 100, with part 2 charting at 104th place. Parts 1 and 3 managed to grab a spot however, coming in at 96th and 88th respectively. If low viewing figures weren't already ringing alarm bells, falling out of the top 100 programs for the week would have only made those bells louder. Still, it was just for one of the Happiness Patrol's three weeks on air, and hopefully we won't see it reoccur for the remainder of season 25. What happened here then? After such a strong season opener, why weren't more audience members tuning into BBC One to see the Doctor and Ace go up against Helen A and her subordinates? I think we can all cite the primary answer to this question would once again be the competition over at ITV. With Wednesday's Coronation Street still airing directly against Doctor Who, more than triple the audiences were tuning in to see the drama on the cobbles instead of the Doctor's exploits on Terra Alpha. Just to acknowledge VCRs, by 1988 VHS was clearly the dominant format of choice for home recording, and whilst more viewers were recording programmes, Doctor Who included, these recorded playbacks weren't considered for the ratings charts, with only live viewers being considered. Promotional efforts around the time of the Happiness Patrol's broadcast, however, was a different story, as Sylvester McCoy in particular was still popping up everywhere on TV. Two days after Remembrance of the Daleks concluded, McCoy, together with Sophie Aldred and former Dr. John Pertwee, appeared on Daytime Live to chat about and celebrate the 25th anniversary. Sylvester would return to the programme just days later on the 1st of November in order to help promote his new BBC One children's show, What's Your Story? Running for four consecutive days over a fortnight period, McCoy served as host and narrator to the various stories the nation's children submitted, with over a million of them calling in, usually suggesting stories of a time travel nature. As if all of this coverage wasn't enough, McCoy would make an appearance on Saturday morning children's show, Going Live, between parts 1 and 2 of The Happiness Patrol on the 5th of November. Broadcasting live from Centre Parks in Nottingham, Sylvester in costume as the Doctor again promoted both Doctor Who as well as What's Your Story. Print coverage for the programme at this time was fairly minuscule in comparison to all of these TV appearances, however all of that would change between parts 2 and 3, when the production team would face the wrath of Bertie Bassett. You see, this is the Candyman. I don't think it's too unreasonable to claim that he bears some design similarities to this gentleman, Bertie Bassett. Clearly the chairman of the confectionery group, HB or Bev Stokes, found this one step too far, and on Thursday the 10th of November submitted a letter to producer John Nathan Turner claiming that Bertie Bassett was being used in Doctor Who as an evil killer in the form of the Candyman. To bolster his arguments, Stokes claimed that he believed this villain would cause confusion in the minds of the public and could have a negative effect on the sale of our products. Stokes requested that a disclaimer be placed onto the remaining episode and that the Candyman character never be used again. The press picked up on all of this drama pretty quickly, 
and soon enough the sensationalist headlines would hit shop shelves, perhaps contributing to the 0.7 million boost in viewership for part 3, but that's just a theory of course. Towards the end of November, BBC Copyright officially refuted the charges, citing no connection. However, they did reassure Bassett that the Candyman would never be used again, and sure enough, over 30 years since his original appearance, he has not graced our TV screens on Doctor Who ever again. Despite the drama over the Candyman, The Happiness Patrol is quite frankly one of the most underrated adventures of the McCoy era. The world of Terra Alpha, despite the happy facade, is deliciously grim in tone, and the various inhabitants within it, whether it's Helen A's group of female mercenaries or those who resist her, the world feels lived in and quite detailed as a result. The author of the serial, Graham Curry, was another new face in the Doctor Who production team, and although he never contributed a script to the programme again, I feel for a first attempt, The Happiness Patrol holds some pretty strong stuff, and even though he was and still is to some degree the subject of ridicule, I actually find the Candyman to be quite a unique villain in Doctor Who's long lineup of enemies. A vicious mind with a killer sense of what it means to feel pleasure, the almost wailing voice, and the distinct design all contribute to him being a memorable villain, and it's a shame that the BBC bowed to Bassett's, probably preventing him from ever being seen on screen again. However, I think the real shining factor of this story is Sheila Hancock's portrayal of Helen A, the head of the Happiness Patrol, who's determined to ensure that happiness will prevail. Her take on the character has allusions to the current Prime Minister of the day, Margaret Thatcher, and indeed, numerous elements of the serial could be cited as a pseudo-statement on the Conservative government of the day. Her downfall is extremely well handled, and also once again shows off how phenomenal of an actor Sylvester McCoy is. Similar to Remembrance, there are little moments littered throughout the Happiness Patrol that really showcase just how different his Doctor is. One highlight is the scene with the two snipers, where the Doctor is able to manipulate them for his own ends, and a scene towards the end in which the Time Lord confronts a devastated Helen A. These scenes are some of the best classic Who has to offer, so I highly recommend that you check those out at the very least, but to be honest, I'd recommend the Happiness Patrol in its entirety. You'll be treated to three episodes of some unique settings, some unique villains, and some interesting questions asked the kind that are present in any high-quality drama. But as you watch it, perhaps go easy on the sweet treats. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.1 million viewers, a 0.3 decrease from the previous story. A decline is never a nice thing to see, but at least it isn't a colossal one. After the hype of the Daleks returning, it seems that a great many of those viewers were willing to stick around, and I'm sure the drama from the Bassett's complaints could have helped at least raise the series' profile once again. But considering this is the 25th anniversary year, to see Doctor Who reduced to pulling in barely over 5 million viewers is a little crushing to say the least. The Happiness Patrol may have elements that may be considered laughable, but if you strip that away, you really do have quite an eerie adventure. Whether it's the inhabitants of Terra Alpha, how Helen A enforces the Happiness Patrol's efforts, the malicious tendencies of the Candyman, in just three episodes, there's plenty to enjoy and soak up. To enjoy your very own fondant surprise, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2009. To watch it, you have the standalone VHS release from 1997, or on DVD as part of the Ace Adventures box set, which also included Dragonfire and was released in 2012. Despite being ridiculed and mocked for years, it is reassuring to see that in recent times, the Happiness Patrol has gained a new appreciation amongst audiences. The running themes of happiness, the suppression of sadness, the political undertones of the late 80s, whether it's from an analytical or recreational point of view, the Happiness Patrol, I believe, continued to mark the progressive change that the lead actor and script editor wanted for the program. A dive into darker subjects, with a much darker Doctor right at the centre of the action. Check it out for yourself, and remember, happiness will prevail. Why don't you do it then? Look me in the eye. Pull the trigger. End my life. The third and penultimate story from season 25 is Silver Nemesis. An ancient Time Lord weapon crashes to Earth, drawing the Doctor and Ace into a battle with Cybermen, Neo-Nazis, and the sinister Lady Painfort. Can the Doctor keep his darkest of secrets? Doctor Who? This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 23rd of November, 1988, and concluded on the 7th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and this is what I call an improvement. For the first time since Revelation of the Daleks back in 1985, Doctor Who was finally able to crack the 6 million mark, with 6.1 million joining the TARDIS team on the anniversary night broadcast. However, it is a shame to see that the audience boost didn't hold, with parts 2 and 3 losing nearly a million viewers, both drawing in 5.2 million instead. Great to see that Silver Nemesis never slipped below the 5 million mark, but after starting strong with over 6 million, the fact that audiences weren't convinced to carry on with the adventure is a little disheartening, 
especially as this was technically the 25th anniversary story. For the top 40 TV programs, Doctor Who was able to avoid slipping below the top 100, though parts 2 and 3 came close, charting at 94th and 98th place respectively. Part 1 leaps above them by quite a margin, managing to settle itself at 76th on the chart. We've got one more story after this, so let's hope that spots within the top 100 are waiting for it. But where did it all go wrong here? A story featuring one of the Doctor's most popular adversaries, going out on the show's actual 25th birthday? 6 million viewers is nice, but why weren't there many more millions tuning in? Once again, Coronation Street was a huge factor in preventing Silver Nemesis from gaining a much higher viewership. You think just over 6 million is a good figure for late 80s Who? Well, the ITV soap was pulling in over 19 million viewers around the same time, way more than three times the amount of viewers watching the Doctor battle the Cybermen. But by this point, the production team knew the almost impossible competition that they faced, and thankfully, Silver Nemesis received arguably the greatest amount of promotional coverage across all of Season 25. Given that this was quite literally the Silver Jubilee adventure, Part 1 was screened at a special celebratory event at the 3001 Space Adventure Tourist Attraction in London on the 15th of November in which Sylvester McCoy, Sophie Aldred, John Nathan Turner, director Chris Clough and composer Keith McCulloch were all in attendance. At this event, numerous interviews were recorded for other programmes, including Hearts of Gold, Behind the Screen and Open Air. Speaking of Open Air, as well as the pre-recorded interviews, appearing in studio to discuss the programme's longevity were former Doctor Who John Pertwee and the show's original producer, Verity Lambert. However, Doctor Who was a focus on Open Air just a few weeks later, as two days after Part 1 on the 25th of November, some complained of the scenes featuring Lady Painfort shooting arrows at pigeons, to which the BBC production office issued a statement reassuring viewers that no birds were hurt in the making of the programme. But whilst all of this 25th anniversary coverage was a great boost for the show, one rather unique slice of promotion would come from the United States. Filmed on location during the filming of Silver Nemesis, the making of Doctor Who was a documentary focusing on the series, aimed at the rapidly expanding American fanbase. Premiering in New Jersey on the 19th of November, John Nathan Turner, who was in attendance, had requested that the documentary be shown on the BBC, but had his request turned down, on the basis that the Beeb found the special to be too American. At the time of this video, its only official release here in the UK was via the Silver Nemesis VHS from 1993. One interesting note is that the theme for the documentary was Doctor in the TARDIS, which was recorded by the Time Lords, later to be known as the KLF, and this tune was released in the June of 1988, and is essentially a club remix of the Doctor Who theme, and as such, it reached number one on the UK singles chart. That's right, a remix of the theme tune became a number one single. Funny how things work out. To top all of this off, Silver Nemesis received a trailer that was aired extensively on BBC One. Using clips from the serial alongside a classic scene from The Web Planet, this trailer aimed to show how far Doctor Who had come in the last quarter century, and together with the extensive promotion on TV, could have helped push those audience numbers over the 6 million mark for part one. In the print world, the coverage was just as extensive. The Radio Times dedicated a four-page colour article to the series, with focus on the various companions over the years, while Sylvester became the first subject interviewed for the brand new My Kind of Day segment of the Listings magazine. On the day of Part 1's broadcast, the anniversary date of the 23rd of November, many publications ran articles celebrating the milestone. The reaction to Silver Nemesis in the press was quite mixed, although a BBC audience research study showed that this story was the most popular of the season. Whether you love it or loathe it, it's abundantly clear that Silver Nemesis was made to be the pseudo 25th anniversary special. Its first episode air date of the 23rd of November was no coincidence, as Silver Nemesis was originally intended to be the final story of season 25, however the delayed launch due to the Olympics coverage meant that the serial would have to go out second to last if it wished to keep that November 23rd air date. Lots of elements are thrown into the story, the return of the Cybermen being the main highlight. I always found it nice how they chose the Cybermen over the Daleks for the anniversary story, cementing just how important the metal monsters are to the world of Doctor Who. It may not be their strongest outing, but their presence is welcome nonetheless, along with their chrome-plated redesign. The other villains vying for the power of the Nemesis are a group of neo-Nazis, led by renowned actor Anton Diffring, and 17th century characters Lady Painfort and her companion Richard. The extensive location work too looks fantastic, and many of the action sequences, like Remembrance, look wonderful. There's lots of nice oddities within Silver Nemesis, many of them being cameo appearances. You have jazz musician Courtney Pine at the top of the story, stage star Dolores Grey in Part 3, a Queen Elizabeth II look-alike, as well as several tourists of Windsor Castle being people who had an association with the programme, including Brigadier actor Nicholas Courtney, directors Andrew Morgan, Fiona Cumming and Peter Moffat, and writers Graham Curry and Kevin Clark. Speaking of the latter, 
Kevin Clark was the third and final new writer to season 25, and for your first script to be penciled as the 25th anniversary story, that must have been no easy feat to tackle. Despite some of his initial ideas being toned down, Clark's script is able to communicate more mystery surrounding the Doctor, continuing the trend we saw in Remembrance of the Daleks and the Happiness Patrol. The final confrontation, between the TARDIS team, the Cybermen and Lady Painfort, offers us a tantalising tease, with the 17th century villain claiming she knows exactly who the Doctor is, threatening to reveal his secrets. And sure, this theme of the Doctor's identity isn't the central focus throughout the story, but these teases and glimpses really do have a weight to them, and help build up this image of the master manipulator and a being of a higher power that the production team wanted to develop. It may have had a lot of silly moments, and as mentioned, it doesn't necessarily show the Cybermen off at their strongest, but if anything, Silver Nemesis is a lot of fun, and if your anniversary special should be anything, at its core, it should be fun. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.5 million viewers, a 0.4 increase from the previous story. It's great to see the averages rise up, especially in time for the 25th anniversary story, but when compared to the 10th and 20th anniversary adventures, Silver Nemesis doesn't hold a candle to them in terms of the ratings. However, despite the insane strength of the competition, and with a good bout of promotion, for Silver Nemesis to finish with the audience it did, is a victory I'm willing to take. It may not be the best anniversary story, it may not be a favourite to many, but if there's one thing I enjoy about this serial that's concurrent with the rest of season 25, it's the feeling of how fresh the experience is. Doctor Who around this time feels like it has a new lease of life, that it's enjoying every moment of, and as a result, you get an adventure that may feel a little lacking in some places, but never is a bore to sit through. To see just who wins control over the Nemesis statue for yourself, you can read the Target book, from 1989, but there's no audio adaptation as of yet. To watch it, you have the 1993 VHS release, which included 11 minutes of previously untransmitted material, and the documentary, The Making of Doctor Who, which had previously been broadcast in North America, and at the time of making this video, still hasn't been included on any future releases of this story. You can also enjoy Silver Nemesis on DVD, bundled together with Revenge of the Cybermen, as part of a twin release box set from 2010. As 25th anniversary stories go, Silver Nemesis may seem a little unconventional, but I admire it all the more for that. It doesn't feel the need to gather multiple Doctors or companions, instead it focuses on telling an interesting story, featuring one of the Doctor's greatest enemies, alongside new foes who have their own impact too. What's more, these mysterious ramifications of just who the Doctor really is would continue to be developed in both this era and the generations to come. But of course, more on that when we get there. Have you never wondered where he came from? Who he is? Nobody knows who the Doctor is. Except me. The fourth and final story from season 25 is the greatest show in the galaxy. Roll up, roll up. The psychic circus has come to Seganax, and it needs acts to keep the audience entertained. The Doctor and Ace are among a weird troop of performers in the ring, where something sinister waits. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 14th of December, 1988, and concluded on the 4th of January, 1989. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and talk about a sporadic way to finish. Parts one and two carry on the consistency that we've seen for most of season 25, with the instalments bringing in 5 and 5.3 million respectively. For part 3, things take a rather unfortunate dip down, with just 4.8 million watching the Doctor face the clowns of the psychic circus. In a dramatic turn of events, however, part 4 manages to not only soar above 6 million, but also attains the honour of being the highest viewed episode of the season, with 6.6 .6 million witnessing the story's conclusion. A figure this high was last achieved in 1985, and even though it was just for one episode, it's nice to see the numbers shoot higher for the programme once again. For the top 40 TV programmes, all episodes managed to stay within the top 100 except for part 3, which sadly dropped out and finished at 108th, the worst chart position for any episode that season. The remaining three episodes all vary, part 2 coming close to dropping out, charting at 99th, part 1 aims a little higher by finishing at 86th, and part 4 unsurprisingly is the winner, managing to notch itself at 79th place. So, we've seen Doctor Who slip out of the top 100 a handful of times during season 25, but it still seems few and far between. But why are these viewing figures all over the place? Why did audiences sink so low before soaring to new heights for season 25? What factors were at play here? Just to get it out of the way, because it's sadly become a fixture at this point, the competition over at ITV was still primarily Coronation Street, and with the Christmas season promising even more heightened drama down at the Rover's return, those already hooked weren't going to switch channel anytime soon. 
However, the fact that the greatest show in the galaxy went out over the Christmas and New Year period could have done Doctor Who some favours. By the late 80s, family viewing of Christmas time programming had become something of a staple amongst the British public. As a result, most programmes, particularly those airing in the evening slots, often received a boost in the ratings table. This could be the reason for why Part 4, which went out a few days into 1989, received the highest viewing figures of the Seventh Doctor's era thus far, with 6.6 .6 million tuning in. The numbers could have been higher if the promotional run continued its positive streak, however it seems that for Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the train slowed down dramatically. For the previous stories in Season 25, the leading actors, production members and figures with an association with the programme have been a constant fixture on various chat shows and children's programmes. However, no such interviews or appearances happened this time around, save for a short item on the BBC2 show, Behind the Screen, which showcased a short clip from Part 1. The TARDIS team did make pop-up appearances on some Christmas-themed programming, however. Sylvester appeared in costume as the Doctor for the Tomorrow's World Christmas Quiz that year, and later the Holiday Quiz, just before the New Year. Whereas Sophie Aldred appeared on Christmas Morning with Noel, which went out on Christmas Day 1988. The print world helped boost the serial a little better, with publications focusing on the guest appearance of popular actor and impressionist Jessica Martin, who was playing the werewolf Max. However, the most notable focus of some articles was the trouble production of the adventure itself. During routine maintenance, asbestos fibres were found in several studios of BBC Television Centre. The corporation closed all of its studios to rectify the issue, and producer John Nathan Turner was informed that The Greatest Show in the Galaxy could continue production as long as it found an alternative studio space. When this proved to be tricky to acquire, some last-minute thinking was required. Given that the vast majority of the story took place within a circus tent, the team was able to put up a makeshift tent in the car park of BBC Elstree Studios. Even though this setup was quite primitive compared to the studios over at Television Centre, the production team were able to complete the remaining work, ensuring that the greatest show in the galaxy would see the light of day, and wouldn't meet the same fate as the cancelled Sharda, which failed to materialise as the season 17 finale back in early 1980. It's such a relief that this serial did make it to air, as it serves to be one of the most unique stories in the vast back catalogue of Doctor Who adventures. The circus setting feels familiar, yet extremely unnerving, whether it's the dingy look of the ring, the eerie presence of the troop of clowns, or the flamboyant characters the TARDIS team meet along the way. Standout performances certainly go to many of the supporting cast. T.P. McKenna is a joy as the self-congratulatory Captain Cook, Jessica Martin delivers a likeable and terrifying performance as Mags, and Ian Reddington delivers true shivers down the spine as the chief clown. With very little spoken dialogue, Reddington's interpretation focuses mainly on physical and facial expressions, which either leave you chuckling or leave you holding your breath in wicked anticipation. The central villains, the gods of Ragnarok, may not do a great deal overall, but have this air of power that works so well with who monsters like this. And it's a shame that we haven't seen them make some sort of return over the years. Greatest show marked the second script from Stephen Wyatt, who made his Who debut the previous year with Paradise Towers. Having been impressed with his work, he was asked to return, and this script both incorporates elements of Paradise Towers, whilst also feeling completely different and unique. It's an adventure that has always commanded a lot of praise and respect, whether from how it overcame the production troubles, or for the weird and wonderful directions it decides to take. The greatest show in the galaxy serves as a fitting conclusion to a season brimming with imagination, wonderful concepts and characters, and a lead who undergoes some of the most extensive development in years. Grab your tickets, and come and join the Psychic Circus. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.4 million viewers, a 0.1 drop from the previous story. So it's clear that the big boost in Part 4 couldn't bring the overall viewership above Silver Nemesis, or even above 6 million, but the fact that the drop is so minuscule for the season finale is reassuring at the very least. Similar to last year's viewing figures, whilst Doctor Who may have remained miles away from its former glories in the ratings charts, it was still attracting a fairly sizeable loyal following, one that would hopefully stick around for next year's run in 1989. The greatest show in the galaxy may not be for everyone, it certainly won't be for you if you have a fear or phobia of clowns, but still to this day, it showcases Doctor Who at its most creative. To take a script revolving around a strange circus, combined with production issues that almost got the serial axed, and to deliver four episodes of fun, imagination, and some really engaging concepts, that's what Doctor Who is all about. To come and watch the antics of the psychic circus for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1989, or its audio adaptation from 2013. To watch it, it made its way to VHS in the year 2000, and then on DVD via a standalone release from 2012. Lots of acrobatics, lots of strange characters and even stranger clowns, this is what The Greatest Show in the Galaxy is all about. It may not have been scheduled to be the closing story of the season, but in many ways it feels quite fitting that it wraps up this run of adventures. 
After the bombastic explosive events of Remembrance of the Daleks, to the eerie goings on in the Happiness Patrol, and after the breath of fresh air that is Silver Nemesis, Greatest Show in many ways feels like a culmination of all of those elements, packaged together in that tried and true Doctor Who format. Definitely check it out for yourself, and I hope you manage to keep the gods of Ragnarok entertained. As I think has been said before, I was an after. Anyway, you ain't seen nothing yet. So that's season 25, the four stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of part 4 of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, season 25 was brought to an end, concluding a three month run, comprised of 14 episodes across four stories. Now let's have a look at the averages for this season. Similar to how season 24 played out, the numbers are very consistent for the most part, with there only being a 0.4 million gap between the most and least viewed episode of the season. The winner is the 25th anniversary story, Silver Nemesis, which had an average of 5.5 million tuning in across its three week run. Given the hype and promotion dedicated to the story in celebration of the anniversary, the crowning achievement here hardly seems surprising, though it is a shame that it only won by 0.1 million against two other stories. The least viewed story was The Happiness Patrol, with 5.1 million on average. A shame really, given the high quality of that story's writing, but on the plus side, if around the 5 million range is where Doctor Who is destined to stay in the final years of the 80s, at least it's managing to hit that target consistently. Though, like season 24, I feel these results represent where the program was in the perceptions of the general viewing audience. Dedicated fans were always bound to tune in, but amongst the wider public, Doctor Who had sadly become somewhat of a joke in many eyes. A relic of a bygone era, a show that had lost its charm and former glory, and now represented cheap sci-fi that the BBC was unwilling to sink more money and time into. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for season 25 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 5.4 million viewers. This is a 0.4 million increase from the season 24 average, which obviously is a marked improvement, but it hardly deserves much celebration as it continued to showcase the fact that Doctor Who wasn't hitting the heights it used to, despite all the changes and innovation going on behind the scenes. When placed alongside the previous 24 seasons, Season 25 charts as the third least viewed season of the program on our journey thus far. It ranks 0.4 million above season 24 and 0.5 million above season 23, which remains in last place. So once again, we have a season that in its year of broadcast fell into the bottom five, a worrying trend that doesn't seem to be getting better. By the time of season 25's conclusion, we can see that four of the five seasons that occupy these bottom slots are from the 1980s. A very unfortunate look at how the program's reputation and appeal amongst UK viewers rapidly diminished. Let's look at the Sylvester McCoy years so far. As mentioned, both seasons 24 and 25 rank as some of the least viewed Doctor Who seasons, at least in terms of the program's first 25 years on air. Things do seem to be improving with the slight increase we see with season 25, but as season 26 was being prepared, we can only hope that this upward trend continues, even if it is by another small margin. Season 25 not only had to turn around a lot of negative perceptions of the program after the previous year, but had to package together four adventures that showcase Doctor Who at its best, right in time for its silver anniversary. In my opinion, they delivered in spades. Each story from season 25 feels wildly different, offers a lot for the audiences to engage with, and each have many memorable characters or moments that fans continue to cite as great examples of the program to this day. Remembrance of the Daleks is often seen as the real 25th anniversary story, with its callbacks to the show's origins and the wonderful use of the Doctor's greatest enemies, pitting them against a rebellious faction of their own race, as well as one of the best supporting character lineups in all of Who. The Happiness Patrol can be overlooked, but I urge you to explore its dark and dingy caverns. The themes employed are a joy to witness, and the Candyman at the very least is a memorable villain. Silver Nemesis may feel like a dud in some respects, but it will make you smile and feel entertained, with the Cybermen appearing to bolster up the stakes. And finally, the greatest show in the galaxy brings it all together, delivering thrills, chills, and several fantastic scenes that highlight the supporting cast and the central TARDIS team, who, quite frankly, have excelled all year. The Doctor and Ace really get to develop their relationship, and this would only continue to see further detailed development the following year. But with season 26 penciled in, just where could the production team go now? What new stories could they come up with that retain the new darker edge of season 25, whilst also developing the relationship of the Doctor and Ace and entertain audiences, and hopefully attracting new viewers. It's a big task to take on to say the least, but how did they do? The year is 1989, and Doctor Who was in quite the perplexing state. On one hand, it had just come off its 25th anniversary, a season that contained four stories of excellent quality with returning foes and new enemies alike. 
all with some great development for companion Ace and for the titular character himself, the Doctor. However, despite this turnaround in storytelling, all was not well behind the scenes. The viewing figures for the program were still quite low compared to its prior success in the 60s, 70s and even early 80s, with season 25 holding around 5.4 million viewers on average. Season 26 had been given the green light, but the production team would soon learn that even the status of a long-running internationally known program like Doctor Who wouldn't always save it from the chopping block, but more on that when we get there. As the autumn drew nearer, four more stories had once again been prepared that aimed to continue the character development for the TARDIS team whilst also introducing new and powerful foes for them to face in a variety of exciting locations and time periods. Sylvester McCoy was back for his third season as the seventh Doctor, with Sophie Aldred returning for her second as Ace. Andrew Cartmell remained script editor, now in his third year, and he was determined to further develop the Doctor's mystique, but also his power. John Nathan Turner also returned as producer, his ninth season at the helm, and was adamant that after long last, this would be his final year. All on board were committed to creating more wonderful adventures to add to the Doctor's records, and indeed, some of them still to this day are considered some of the best that Classic Who has to offer. But would this continued innovation finally see the viewing figures rise back up to stable levels, or would they remain low and further weaken the Doctor's chances of surviving into the 1990s? Join me as we delve right into Season 26 and find out. The first story from Season 26 is Battlefield. A mysterious message pulls the Doctor and Ace into an ancient battle with an evil sorceress and knights from space. Can the Doctor, or Merlin, prevent his oldest friend getting caught in the crossfire? This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 6th of September, 1989, and concluded on the 27th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and oh dear, this is not good at all. Three of the story's four episodes crash below 4 million, with part four just hanging on, and part one records the lowest audience showing for a Doctor Who episode on our journey thus far, with just 3.1 million viewers sitting down for the season premiere. Part two manages to bring things up to 3.9 million, before part three dips down to 3.6 million, with part four finishing at bang on 4 million. So whilst the numbers improve throughout Battlefield's run, this is an absolutely abysmal showing for 1989 standards. In 26 years of broadcasting, this is arguably Doctor Who's worst showing in its history thus far. We can only hope that things rapidly improve as the season progresses. For the top 40 TV programs, rather amazingly, only part one fell out of the top 100, charting at 102nd, with the other three instalments coming close to doing the same, but coming in at 91st, 95th, and 89th respectively. The fact that most of Battlefield was able to hold on within the top 100 is quite impressive given the dismal viewing figures, but this low charting start continues a trend over the last few years, a trend that sadly makes a coveted spot in the top 40 seem ever more elusive for Doctor Who. So just what on earth happened here? Why were the viewing figures for Battlefield so woefully low? Why weren't people tuning in? Well, in terms of promotion, it wasn't for want of trying. While season 26 was still being made, Doctor Who was making an impact in the world of the theatre. Running from March until August, The Ultimate Adventure starred John Pertwee and later Colin Baker as the third and sixth Doctors respectively, battling Daleks and Cybermen in a theatrical extravaganza. Reviews were mixed, but audiences generally enjoyed the show, so even though not directly related with season 26, this extra attention could have only been a good thing. A press launch for the new season was held on the 16th of August, in which producer John Nathan Turner, together with Sophie Aldred and guest actor Gene Marsh, all appearing to help promote Battlefield. But already at this stage, even before the season began airing, all was not well behind the scenes. There were murmurs circulating that production on the prospective 1990 season of Doctor Who, season 27, was to be delayed, with talks of a US production company wanting to co-produce with the BBC. Back in the present, the Radio Times listings magazine offered a slice of the back page article to Doctor Who a week before season 26 began. This was penned by Sophie Aldred and focused on the creatures that the TARDIS team would be facing. Further promotional appearances included Sylvester McCoy and JNT popping up at the Doctor Who Space Adventure Exhibition on the 2nd of September, and later, on Saturday the 16th of September, McCoy would appear as the Doctor on the Noel Edmonds Saturday Roadshow, in which he joined the titular presenter in a skit about the TARDIS breaking down. Several leading newspapers covered season 26 beginning transmission, so with all this relatively mainstream coverage, why did Battlefield still suffer in the viewing figures table? Well, we now turn to the dominating factor to this answer competition. Doctor Who maintained its Wednesday broadcast slot from the previous year, still going out at around 7.35pm, its latest time slot on our journey so far. 
However, this time slot would pit the Time Lord once again against ITV's most popular programme, Coronation Street. The long-running soap opera continued its dominance of the TV charts, often with more than 10 million tuning in. Not only that, but on the night of Part 1's broadcast, a major football game was underway on BBC Two. So, with the majority of viewers either focused on the Rovers' return or the football pitch, Doctor Who stood very little chance of achieving success. Not long after the disastrous ratings for Part 1 came in, John Nathan Turner had some unfortunate news to deliver to his two leading actors. On Monday the 11th of September, JNT wrote formally to Sylvester and Sophie, informing them of events concerning the following year, and we'll elaborate more on that when we get there. Battlefield itself is often seen as the black sheep, or odd one out of season 26, in terms of its quality, and in my opinion, I have to disagree. Sure, some of the digital effects and snippets of dialogue are a bit ropey, and compared to some of the previous McCoy adventures, and with what's to come, it may feel a little lacklustre, but there's still so much to enjoy. Front and centre to that enjoyment is the return of Unit, together with long-standing favourite, Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, played once again by Nicholas Courtney. His final appearance in Doctor Who, Courtney steps back into his most iconic character with complete ease and remains just as entertaining and engaging as ever. It was originally planned that he would be killed off, going out in a blaze of glory, but this was changed for production, with the brig surviving pretty much unscathed. The writer of this serial, Ben Aronovich, had previously penned the season 25 opener, Remembrance of the Daleks, a story that achieved great success and is still fondly remembered today. His second script hasn't achieved the same level of praise, but Aronovich has gone on since to say he wasn't fully happy with every aspect of Battlefield's realisation to screen. He was happy to bring back the Brigadier, though quite understandably, the thought of killing off a popular 20-year-old character is quite a task for a fairly new writer to a long-standing show. However, Lethbridge Stewart isn't the only one representing Unit, for we have a new Brigadier, Winifred Bambera, played wonderfully by Angela Bruce. This feisty female leading a Unit troop is wonderful to see, and would help lay the groundwork for various female characters in the series' revival. And we have Bessie come back too, and come on, you can never get tired of seeing the old Edwardian roadster in action. The villains of Battlefield are equally entertaining, with Jean Marsh playing a deliciously evil Morgane. Jean was no stranger to Doctor Who, having appeared twice in the Hartnell era, most notably as short-lived companion Sarah Kingdom. Despite the melodramatic nature of the character, she's clearly loving every second of this role, and some of her confrontations with the Doctor are true highlights of season 26. Throughout the adventure, she refers to the Doctor as Merlin, a glimpse into a potential life held by the Time Lord, further prompting intrigue and questions from those around him. Similar to the previous year, script editor Andrew Cartmel was committed to further developing the notion of a more powerful, mysterious, and in some cases, manipulative Doctor. We see smatterings of that in Battlefield, a particular highlight being the Doctor's confrontation with Morgane, convincing her through words and words alone to abandon the pursuits of unleashing a nuclear war. We're accustomed to the Doctor making grand speeches in the modern series, but to see it happen in the final days of Classic Who is fantastic. The Destroyer is an absolute triumph of makeup and costume design, and is quite the intimidating presence. It's just a shame we only really get to see him in action during the last few minutes of Part 4. But as I said, despite its numerous flaws or misgivings, Battlefield is still a blast to sit through. Whether it's the returning characters, the new foes, the action sequences, or the quieter moments in between, I'm certain there'll be something in this adventure that will appeal to everyone. Overall, this story attracted an average of 3.7 million viewers, a 1.7 million drop from the last story broadcast, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. This is quite a disheartening drop to say the least, the glimmering hope of Season 25's achievements seemingly dashed away in an instant. What's more, Battlefield's average is the lowest average attained by a Doctor Who story in its 26-year history thus far, and the only story to average under 4 million viewers. These are accolades that no adventure would wish to bear, but sadly, someone's got to do it, and Battlefield has been bearing those results ever since. We also have some repeat data for you. To celebrate the programme's 30th anniversary in 1993, BBC Two was home to screenings of Doctor Who repeats, with one story representing each Doctor. Battlefield was chosen to represent the Sylvester McCoy era, and went out on four consecutive Fridays from the 23rd of April to the 14th of May 1993. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which garnered an average of 1.3 million viewers, a 2.4 million drop from the original broadcast. Whilst this result is far worse than the 1989 screening, this sort of figure had sadly become the staple for Doctor Who repeats in the 90s. While still retaining a sizeable loyal fanbase, the programme no longer enjoyed the same public profile and presence it had amongst the general public across the past three decades, with a vastly increased amount of channels for audiences to tune into, and new programming coming in all the time, 
Classic Who at this point, whilst gaining an affection, didn't stand much of a chance. Battlefield may not be viewed as an absolute classic these days, but it certainly maintains the sense of fun and freshness that several stories from the Sylvester McCoy era have in spades. To take part in the eternal battle for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1991 or its forthcoming audio adaptation, which will be released in 2022. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1998, in which three minutes of previously unbroadcast material were included. Alternatively, you have a standalone DVD release from 2008, or Battlefield can be enjoyed on Blu-ray, via the Season 26 collection set, which was released in 2020. With its callbacks to medieval legends, parallels with the potential devastation of nuclear war, Battlefield manages to straddle fantasy and sci-fi concepts with the terrifyingly real threats of the late 80s. The Brigadier's return is an absolute treat for those who enjoyed his previous appearances, the new remodelled unit is great, the leads get several great moments too, there's so much going on and sure, not all of it lands, but it's a cracking good time. Just make sure you don't end up in a water tank. Sophie Aldred will tell you that for nothing. I just do the best I can. The second story from Season 26 is Ghostlight. Dark deeds are taking place within the corridors and rooms of Gabriel Chase. What creature is held captive in the cellar, and why is Josiah Samuel Smith so scared of it? To solve the mystery of Gabriel Chase, the Doctor must help Ace face her past. This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 4th of October, 1989, and concluded on the 18th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and thankfully, no individual episode fell below the 4 million mark, albeit only barely. Audience figures continued to rise for part one of Ghostlight, providing the peak of the story's viewership with 4.2 million tuning in. Part two records a small drop down to bang on 4 million, with part three holding that figure steady for the story's conclusion. Despite being a clear improvement over Battlefield in terms of viewership, these numbers are still quite disastrous, and don't bode well for the program's reputation or future behind the scenes. Looking over at the top 40 programs chart, both parts one and two managed to retain a spot within the top 100, coming in at 94th and 93rd respectively. However, part three falls out of that bracket, finishing up at 104th place, the lowest position for a season 26 episode thus far. Whilst the top 40 may be elusive, hopefully we won't see episodes continuously fall out of the top 100 as we progress through season 26. So, if small pockets of audience members were now tuning into Doctor Who, what efforts were made to help Ghostlight both retain them and attempt to attract new viewers at the same time? To address the obvious, Coronation Street was still the prime competitor for Doctor Who, and as such, trounced it by two or even sometimes three times the amount of viewing figures. By the end of the 1980s, VCRs were common in millions of households, and whilst I'm sure many fans back in the day recorded Doctor Who, their delayed viewings were sadly not counted in the viewing figures compilation process. With live viewers still being the prime decider, Corey had Doctor Who backed into a corner, but that didn't mean the TARDIS team would go down without a fight. Promotional efforts for Ghostlight, however, were seemingly lacklustre in comparison to Battlefield. Small clips from the serial were shown to journalists at Season 26's press launch back in August, and a day after Part 3's broadcast, viewers gave their thoughts on the serial on the BBC's open-air programme. But there was no feature in the Radio Times, no promotional spots by any of the actors or production team on TV. It's almost as if the BBC were happy to let Doctor Who coast along rather than give it the promotion that it needed. But decisions behind the scenes had already been made, and those decisions may have played into the programme's reduced presence in promotional material. But we'll touch on that a little bit later. Ghostlight is an adventure that embodies both a classic, haunted house kind of vibe, together with a script brimming with horror and good character work, particularly for Ace. We learn of the connection she has with the house they inhabit, what it means to her, and an insight into the Doctor's grand plan, what he's setting her up for, and how he's seemingly pulling most of the strings. Sylvester and Sophie have always been a fantastic pair, but it's the quieter scenes they have together that I think really shine, and in many of them, foreshadow the development that is still to come for the pair throughout the rest of season 26. The halls of Gabriel Chase are absolutely gorgeous. The BBC's expertise and experience with period settings, both in design and costume, is absolutely top-notch. Speaking of costumes, the monstrous husks are quite terrifying upon their reveal, so much so that BBC One controller Jonathan Powell requested that shots of the husks be removed from the series trailer seen at the press launch. The writer for Ghostlight was newcomer Mark Platt, a long-time Doctor Who fan, and a writer brimming with ambition and imagination. His original script was so complex and intricate that it sadly suffered when it came to production. With the story only being allocated three episodes, several sequences had to be cut, resulting in a finale with the reveal of light and his purpose coming across as a little muddled. 
the final script was restricted in such a way that many of the actors, the director, and other members of the crew had to consistently get in touch with Platt to clarify just what was going on. It is a shame that the intended impact and ideas of Ghostlight aren't able to be realised to the fullest extent, but we still have an atmospheric character drama in three parts. Knock off all the lights, settle down on the sofa, and get ready to be thrilled and feel chilled alongside the TARDIS team. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.1 million viewers, a 0.4 increase from the previous story. It's great to see the trajectory improve, and for the program to break the 4 million mark, but when you compare this result to many of the results seen over the last 26 years, it's still quite a disappointing one. With powerful competition from Coronation Street and lackluster promotional efforts, Ghostlight's low average hardly comes across as a surprise. But don't let low viewing figures put you off. Ghostlight remains an endearing example of the darker, more character-driven directions that the creative team wanted to go in. Combined with wonderful haunting atmosphere, memorable side characters, chilling villains and quite a shining conclusion, you have an adventure that is bound to stick in your mind for one reason or another. To bask in the glorious light for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2011. To watch it, you have the 1994 VHS release or a standalone DVD release from 2004. You can also enjoy Ghostlight and all the other stories from this run in the Season 26 Blu-ray collection set from 2020. Often seen as the start of a pseudo-trilogy for Ace, which would run for the remainder of the season, Ghostlight serves as an intriguing opener. We learn that the Doctor's young friend is far more than just a girl who asks questions and tells the Doctor how brilliant he is. She's got demons to face, and together with the Doctor, we see her start to face them here. It's worth noting that Ghostlight was the last story to be recorded in Doctor Who's original 26-year run. Audiences still had two more adventures to experience, but for the regular members of the production team, the events of Gabriel Chase would prove to be their swan song in making the long-running science fiction staple. Light! Light? The third and penultimate story from season 26 is The Curse of Fenric. The Doctor and Ace arrive at a remote World War II naval base as a brilliant scientist deciphers ancient runes and the commanding officer lays a trap for Russian soldiers. The wolves of Fenric are running, and evil is stirring. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 25th of October, 1989, and concluded on the 15th of November. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and whilst the numbers now seem to be holding steady, it's far from the big boost that Doctor Who arguably needed. Part 1 marks the peak of the story's viewership at 4.3 million, with parts 2 and 3 recording the joint lowest, at just 4 million viewers. Part 4 gets a little boost to 4.2 million, but again, when looked at on the whole, this is far from a strong showing. And as we're three stories into season 26, it's clear that the overall audience had once again been diminished somewhat, and that a swath of new viewers were not setting their televisions to BBC One. Unfortunately, the data regarding the Curse of Fenric's placement within the top 40 programmes is unavailable, but to make an educated guess based on how the previous few stories did, I would have hoped that all four episodes managed to stick within the top 100, even if they barely managed to cling on. But why weren't more people watching The Curse of Fenric? Considering what this story and arguably this whole season had going for it, what was preventing Doctor Who from experiencing a renewed renaissance? The biggest obstacle was undeniably Coronation Street, which was still being shown directly against Doctor Who as the Christmas season loomed closer. The later months of the year are always a busy time for soap operas, so the already astronomical viewing figures attained by the cast of The Cobbles only continue to grow larger, widening the gap between itself and the TARDIS team. However, on the more positive side, promotional efforts for The Curse of Fenric seemed considerably more prevalent than they were for Ghostlight. Much press attention was focused on the guest appearance of Nicholas Parsons, a popular game show host which included programmes such as Sale of the Century, a former competitor to Doctor Who back in the 70s, and the radio panel show Just a Minute, which Parsons had hosted regularly since 1967 and would continue to do so up until 2019. His guest spot in The Curse of Fenric made the papers as early as May 1989, in which the actor commented that, I've never had so much fun in my life. Parsons' role would again be a focus closer to broadcast, appearing in an article within the Radio Times, and also appearing alongside the two regulars and guest star Julian Holloway at a press event on the 19th of October. On this day, the first episodes of both The Curse of Fenric and the series finale, Survival, were premiered to the press at BAFTA. Further celebrations were in effect on the 21st of October, when Sylvester, Sophie and JNT made an appearance at Centrepoint in London to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Doctor Who magazine. 
a dedicated publication which had been running continuously since 1979. However, despite all of this positive promotion, more negative news was coming to light regarding the program. On the 21st, best-selling Dishrag, The Sun, ran a story in which a member of the production team had supposedly confided to the tabloid, saying that, Our only hope is for an independent production company to step in and save it. But after various rumours and faux reporting from the tabloids, on the 23rd of October, DJ Steve Wright confirmed on his BBC Radio 1 show that there wouldn't be a new series of Doctor Who in 1990. This wasn't a direct statement about Wright cancellation, but to break the series' 26-year running chain wasn't viewed as a good sign. Presenter Anne Robinson tried to lessen the flames on an edition of Points of View that went out on the 1st of November, shortly after Part 2's transmission. Robinson denied the claim that the BBC had axed Doctor Who, but arguably the worst news was yet to come. We'll dive more into that a little bit later. The Curse of Fenric is arguably the crowning jewel of Season 26. It's this story that not only serves as a culmination of Ace's journey with the Doctor so far, but a shining example of the sort of stories, themes and characters that script editor Andrew Cartmel, together with his team of writers, wanted to inject back into the programme. The warring nations of World War II, the wonderfully designed blood-sucking hemovores, and the titular Fenric himself stand out as some of the greatest elements of late 80s Who. Fenric's power is quite intimidating, and his past battles with the Doctor imply a greater battle than perhaps we would ever see on the screen. One of the best scenes is one close to the end of Part 4, in which the Doctor and Ace are faced with a possessed Captain Sorin, who is being controlled by Fenric. I won't spoil it all, but to witness what the Doctor must do to Ace in order to save her and help defeat Fenric is one of the best classic Who moments ever, in terms of performance, writing, and how it plays out. Sophie Aldred absolutely steals the show in this serial too, continuing Ace's development in the second part of this pseudo-trilogy, allowing her to face her past, namely the contempt that she held for her mother. It's fitting then that the writer who penned this story is Ian Briggs. Having written the season 24 story Dragonfire, in which Ace was first introduced, Ian returns to summarise the character's journey and growth so far, how the Doctor's involvement has been integral to it, but also what sort of conflict that can create between the pair. There are so many other wonderful elements of this serial, such as Nicholas Parsons, who you'd never guess was primarily known as a light-hearted game show host, as his performance is both powerful and heartbreaking in how Reverend Wainwright faces off the Hemovores. In short, The Curse of Fenric is essential viewing if you're looking to dive into Classic Who, featuring some of the strongest performances, most memorable moments, and character work that begins to lay the groundwork for what we would see when the programme returned in the 21st century. Just make sure you remember what you hold faith in. It may come in handy should you have to face the Ancient One. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.1 million viewers, the same result as the previous story. It's disappointing to see that the small growth in viewership hasn't continued, but at least they haven't plummeted back downwards, especially to below 4 million. Hardly a strong showing, but if Doctor Who was still able to retain a somewhat consistent live viewership, there were still ever small glimmers that the show would avoid the ever-looming chopping block. The Curse of Fenric encapsulates all the best elements of a good Doctor Who story, while still injecting it with the running continuity of Ace's character growth and the further deepening of the Doctor's mystery and manipulative acts. There's a lot to love here, and if you want to experience it for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2015. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991, which was the first McCoy era story to hit the format and was an extended cut, featuring six minutes of added material. In the 21st century, viewers could experience The Curse of Fenric via DVD, thanks to a standalone release from 2003, or via the Season 26 collection set, which was released exclusively to the Blu-ray format in 2020. The Curse of Fenric is arguably the story from the Sylvester McCoy era that comes the closest to script editor Andrew Cartmel's vision for the programme. A dismal setting, some great villains, a lead character who is confident in his power and ability, and a companion who is resourceful, fully independent, yet also unaware of their travelling friend's master plans. It's an absolute triumph from start to finish, and makes you wonder if future adventures in the years to come will adopt a similar template. Was that guaranteed to happen though? Not necessarily, at least, not immediately. We play the contest again. Time the fourth and final story from season 26 is Survival. The Doctor takes Ace home to Perivale, where her friends have vanished. But to where? Savage forces are at work, and when they're transported to the planet of the Cheetah People, an old enemy lies in wait. This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 22nd of November, 1989, 
and concluded on the 6th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and we have a sizable improvement to round off the season. For the first and only time this year, Doctor Who was able to just about crack 5 million viewers, with parts 1 and 3 both hitting the mark, tying for the adventure's most viewed installment. Part 2 is the odd one out, dropping a little lower down to 4.8 million, but that figure alone eclipses the three previous stories, both on an individual basis and on overall average. 5 million viewers is still quite a poor showing for a 26-year-old program in 1989, but in regards to just season 26, this result is the biggest victory we have to celebrate. For the top 40 TV programs, thankfully all three episodes of Survival were able to find a place within the top 100, with part 1 achieving the story's peak at 89th, part 2 coming close to dropping out at 96th, and part 3 resting in the middle at 91st. The classic series bows out without striking the top 40, but for its last adventure to at least hang around in the top 100, I'll take that achievement for all it's worth. So, how did things close out here? With Survival being the season finale, what was it about the adventure that caused that last little extra boost in audience members to sit down and watch it unfold? It might be surprising to say, but it could have been the ever-growing rumours and eventual confirmation that Doctor Who wouldn't return for a series in 1990. I've teased you long enough, so let's delve into just what was going on. Back in September, shortly after season 26 began transmitting, John Nathan Turner wrote to both Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred, informing them that their contracts for a prospective fourth season would not be taken up. This devastating news lent to the stirring comments that Doctor Who wasn't just taking a year off, but was going to be axed for good. After the confirmation that a 1990 season wouldn't materialise in October, numerous letters were sent to the controller of BBC One, Jonathan Powell, expressing sadness and outrage at the decision. An official response came from the head of drama, Peter Grugin, who aimed to clarify that there were no plans to axe Doctor Who, and that there may be a little longer between this series and the next than usual. If only he knew then how long that wait would be. So whilst not officially being marked as cancelled, Doctor Who seemingly was being winded down quietly, taking an extended rest with an uncertain future. The notion of an independent production company coming in to help fund and produce the show was still circulating, and several bids were put forward to the BBC. These included Saffron Productions, run by former Who writer Victor Pemberton, Cinema Verity, ran by the first Doctor Who producer, Verity Lambert, Coast to Coast, a company who at this point still held the option to make a Doctor Who movie, and perhaps most prolifically, a partnership of Dalek creator Terry Nation and Cybermen co-creator Jerry Davis. The pair disliked the way the programme had been showcased over the past few years, and the two writers promised to get American financial backing to reduce the amount of violence and even potentially film the series on a worldwide scale. Despite Crugeen's comments about the gap between seasons being longer than usual, the BBC claimed that a decision regarding the new co-producers would be made in early 1990. That came and went, and by August of that year, no announcement had been made, and the longer gap than usual would continue to go on, and on, and on. But for how long exactly? That's a story for another day. But let's get back to Survival, the story that would prove to be the final adventure in the show's original 26-year run. Despite the raised viewing figures, Doctor Who still battled against daunting competition from Coronation Street over on ITV. It had been a long three-year battle against the long-running soap opera, a battle which sadly the TARDIS team were never able to triumph. But a continued resistance has to be commended, even in the face of poor results. Promotion for the serial remained at a somewhat steady level, however wasn't always a success with the press. After a special press call was held for the appearance of guest star comedians Hale and Pace, only one paper, the Sunday Mirror, showed up in attendance. Much of the press also derided survival as it went to air, chiding various elements of its production and supporting the notion that the series needed more money or in some cases, should just be axed altogether. Despite all of the press derision, the promotional train kept on chugging along, with numerous members of the Who production team appearing on different programmes. Sylvester McCoy appeared on that year's Children in Need telethon, whilst producer John Nathan Turner popped up on Mega Quiz 89 and later on Open Air to help promote and celebrate 50 years of BBC's Ealing Studios. Despite the sad news of not making a fourth season together, lead actors Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred thankfully had a lot more work to sink their teeth into. Both were in pantomime for Christmas, with Sophie in Cinderella and Sylvester in Aladdin, and both actors worked extensively in the theatre throughout 1990, as well as attending various Doctor Who and sci-fi related events and conventions. Despite their success acting-wise, Who fans were left with even more doom and gloom after Sylvester made an appearance on open air on the 19th of December 1989. Speaking with Eamon Holmes, the actor said that Doctor Who wouldn't be seen until 1991 at the earliest. Again, if only he knew. 
Survival unintentionally perhaps serves as quite a fitting end to the classic run of Doctor Who on television. It adopts a modern day Earth setting, with characters who feel distinctly current for their time, and an environment in which Ace both comes from and is able to thrive in. Exploring her past, her friends and her connections with Perivale, this sort of dedication of storytelling to a companion's origins and background had arguably not been done before in the program. And as mentioned, this focus on a modern day setting for a modern day companion would be the template used when Doctor Who returned to TV in 2005. The main creatures of the serial are the Cheetah People, a rather fascinating concept, their planet included. And even if their design on screen makes them look a little cuddly, the performances from the actors help convey the animalistic nature of the beings. The main villain, however, sees the return of an old foe, the Master, played once again by Anthony Ainley. Having played the Renegade Time Lord since 1981, Ainley, just like Nicholas Courtney with the Brigadier, slips back seamlessly into the role, nailing the melodramatic moments while sprinkling his now signature sense of charm and malevolence into the mix as well. His descent and fall to the planet of the Cheetah People is really quite chilling, especially when we see its influence spread to not only Ace, but the Doctor as well. The writer for the season finale was another newcomer to the programme, Rona Munro. Hailing from Scotland, Rona is mainly known nowadays for extensively popular theatre work, but this was one of her first TV engagements, and I've gotta say, she knocks it out of the park. Survival feels very different, not just to other eras of classic Who, but to other stories in season 26 as well. The focus on the modern day, plus the continuation of Ace's journey as a character, works a treat, just as well as it did in Ghostlight and the Curse of Femric. There are several individual moments I can pick out in the story's three parts that stand out as being excellent, but really, the best way to experience survival is definitely to sit down and watch it for yourself. It's a fitting end to the classic series run, it showcases how far the show has come in 26 years, and it's a rip roaring good adventure to boot, giving us a great final outing for Anthony Ainley's master, Sophie Aldred's ace, and in many respects, Sylvester McCoy's seventh doctor. Well, almost. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.9 million viewers, a 0.8 increase from the previous story. It's fantastic that right at the very end, Doctor Who got a much needed sharper boost. Sure, it wasn't able to crack 5 million, and the results we have are far from fantastic, but for more people to watch the show as it quietly came to a conclusion, gives us one final glimmer of hope that the program was still watched, and loved, by the viewers who tuned in. Despite coming right at the very end of Classic Who, Survival remains a great story to delve into, even if you're in the early stages of exploring Doctor Who. Thanks to its many similarities to the early days of the revival, great character work for the two leads, the main villain, and a world that feels truly alien and quite threatening and enticing all at the same time. To venture to the planet of the Cheetah people for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2017. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1995, the standalone DVD release from 2007, or as part of the season 26 collection set, which was released on Blu-ray in 2020. It may not feel like the grand finales we expect in television these days, but survival absolutely thrives in how low-key, yet intense it is. The moments of action and tension are superbly handled. The actors are giving their all in these performances, even if you have one or two clunkier moments. Do you know what I'm talking about? But when all is said and done, considering this was the last Doctor Who story for quite some considerable time, I think survival succeeds in every way in which it could. If we fight like animals, we'll die like animals! So that's season 26, the four stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of part three of survival, season 26 was brought to an end, concluding a three month run, comprised of 14 episodes across four stories. Now, let's have a look at the averages for this season. It's a shame that for the final season of Classic Who, the viewing figures were arguably at their poorest. No story is able to crack 5 million viewers, and the least viewed story, the season opener, Battlefield, falls below 4 million, with just 3.7 million viewers on average tuning in. On the other end of the spectrum, the season finale, Survival, comes in as the most viewed story of season 26, with 4.9 million viewers on average, a 1.2 jump from Battlefield. The middle stories, Ghostlight and The Curse of Fenric, attain the same result of 4.1 million, but it's so interesting that despite the abysmally low start, the numbers did gradually improve, culminating in a nice little jump for the season finale. So, something was working, but it just didn't provide enough of an impact to help see Doctor Who through into the 1990s. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for season 26 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 4.2 million viewers, a 
a 1.2 million drop from the previous season's average. To witness a drop between seasons is always a shame, but to see a drop of over a million in just the space of a year, now that's truly tragic. This leans into the idea that Doctor Who just wasn't a massively popular program anymore, at least in terms of the general audience. Fans were always going to tune in, of course, but the hyper success the show experienced in the mid 60s and 70s was seemingly long gone. To the wider public, it no longer felt like television you had to make time for, more like an out of date relic from glory days gone by. When placed alongside the previous 25 seasons, season 26 unfortunately finishes up dead last, being 0.7 million behind season 23, which moves up one place after three years. Again, I think it's a great shame that the final season of Classic Who ends up being the bottom in pretty much everything, especially when the quality of the four stories within it is absolutely fantastic. Just goes to show that back then and even today, it doesn't necessarily all rest on how good your storytelling is, as if the competition is strong enough, or the promotional efforts are somewhat lacklustre, the more casual members of the audience are less likely to watch. Looking at the three McCoy seasons, we can see that the numbers aren't phenomenal overall, but there is a clear odd one out. The improvements seen between season 24 and 25 have been dashed away, with the significant drop with season 26 resulting in quite an underwhelming swan song. With Doctor Who taking an unknown amount of rest, there didn't feel like anything to celebrate, the show having bowed out with some of its lowest viewing figures to date. An underwhelming final result for what I believe is truly one of the strongest periods of quality in Doctor Who's history. But now, as we've reached the end of another Doctor's era, it's time we got really nerdy with numbers and work out the overall average for the Sylvester McCoy years. By combining the results achieved from seasons 24, 25 and 26, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for the Sylvester McCoy era of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 4.9 million viewers. This low result sadly now means that this is the least viewed era of the program thus far, falling lower than the previous holder, the Colin Baker years, by quite a margin. Speaking of other Doctors, the McCoy years fall 2.2 million behind Patrick Troughton, 3.4 million behind John Pertwee, a colossal 4.5 million behind Tom Baker, 3 million behind both William Hartnell and Peter Davison, and finally 1.5 million behind the previous least viewed Doctor, Colin Baker. This result could have been predicted based on the results from seasons 24 and 25 alone, but the catastrophic showings from season 26 I believe really served as the final nail in the coffin of the McCoy era in regards to viewing figures. Similar to Colin Baker's tenure, McCoy also suffered significantly in the story count department, having only 12 televised adventures during his three years in the role. This is obviously a far cry from the amount of stories that Hartnell, Troughton and even Davison had in their three year stints, but we have to remember McCoy's era only was allocated 14 episodes a year, and to be honest, I think fans of the program were just happy to get anything in the final few years of the 1980s. And now we're about to get really, really nerdy with numbers and calculate the overall viewing average over the entire 26 year run of classic Doctor Who. By combining the individual averages from season one all the way through to season 26, we can calculate that the overall viewing average for the original run of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 7.9 million viewers. For a show spanning over a quarter of a century, to gain an overall average of nearly 8 million viewers, including the lower results of the late 80s, is certainly impressive. I think the main thing to take away from this result is, whether it was the black and white days of the 60s, the colour and flamboyance of the 70s, or the experimentation and darker tones of the 80s, Doctor Who, at its core, always had a substantially loyal viewer base one that was able to see it through multiple decades, multiple production changes and challenges, and one that helped create a legacy for one of British television's national institutions. Season 26 is a tale of two halves in my opinion. On one hand you have a season that is absolutely brimming with creativity and imagination, with four stories that endeavour to further strengthen the leading characters, whilst also presenting audiences with memorable new monsters, great atmospheric locations, some returning faces both good and evil, and some truly standout moments for our mysterious leading man and his ever resourceful companion. However, on the other hand, you have a season that is continuously marred by the goings on behind the scenes. The confirmation of no 1990 season, the unspecified rest time that the show was going to take, the uncertainty of an outside production company coming in, and perhaps most prevalent, the news of John Nathan Turner's departure as producer after nearly 10 years, and Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred's contracts not being renewed for the immediate future. It was difficult for Doctor Who fans to celebrate the creative renaissance going on with the program, and thanks to the diminished reputation that Doctor Who now had, more casual viewers were now less likely to tune in. And tune in they didn't. Whether it was Coronation Street stealing millions away, or the lacklustre promotion for certain stories not creating enough of a buzz, Doctor Who had tried everything it could to survive into the 1990s. 
and it seemed that by the end of 1989 that it had failed. But remember to focus on the stories themselves, and the sheer quality that many of them possess. Whether it's the old flavourings of an Earthbound adventure in Battlefield, the chilling events of Ghostlight, the dramatic and powerful curse of Fenric, or the low-key yet intense goings on in Survival, Season 26 set out to give the audience adventures that not only felt modern, fresh, and interesting, but ones that would shock them, entertain them, and keep them hooked for years to come. And a consistently vital ingredient into why this season works so well has to be Sylvester McCoy as the Seventh Doctor. Having primarily made his name as a stuntman in the Ken Campbell Roadshow, and as a children's entertainer in programmes such as Eureka and Vision On, Sylvester McCoy had quite an uphill battle when he first took the role of the Doctor back in 1987. Despite the fact his first year piloting the TARDIS is often cited as being over comedic and campy, Sylvester right from the off delivered performances that both captured the whimsical, fun nature of the Time Lord, but also a certain alien quality too, letting the audience remember that he isn't quite like us in every respect. This only continued with seasons 25 and 26, McCoy really being allowed to flex his acting muscles to embody a Doctor who acts a lot more mysteriously, tries his hand at manipulation, and presents a darker, more moody persona than many of his previous incarnations. After the show came to an abrupt end in 1989, Sylvester never distanced himself too far from the program. He continued to attend conventions and to make cameo appearances in character as the Doctor throughout the 1990s on a variety of different shows. In 1993, he returned alongside a wealth of former Doctors and Companions for the pseudo 30th anniversary special, Dimensions in Time, which of course, is canon. Helping to keep the presence of the program alive as the world raced towards the 21st century, McCoy was one of the first Doctors to become involved with audio production company Big Finish, and over the last 20 years, he's led dozens of full cast audio dramas, allowing him to continue his incarnation's development. This included a realisation of the prospective season 27, had the program continued into 1990. The four planned stories have all been adapted and released by Big Finish, for which I highly recommend you give them a listen. A fan of the modern Doctor Who series, Sylvester has frequently praised the new show, its creative team, and acknowledges how his last year in the show offered a strong template for the revival. At nearly 80 years old, he still continues to play the Doctor to this day, not just in audio form, but even in the visual medium. In 2021, to help promote the release of his first season on Blu-ray, McCoy appeared in costume as the Seventh Doctor once again, still playing the spoons, still providing smiles and joy to everyone who sets eyes on him. It's so wonderful to see Sylvester's run on TV get a lot more reappraisal in recent years, and even if at the time he was often wrongly targeted for bringing about the end of the program, he can rest easy, as we all can, that he did everything in his power to keep it going. And as the Seventh Doctor, he remains a firm favourite incarnation to many, and will continue to do so for many years to come. And of course I haven't forgotten to mention he did also make one appearance as the Doctor in 1996, in an attempt to hand the baton on and bring the series back for the 1990s. But we'll touch more on that another time. But what was going to happen now? With Doctor Who being off the air, and with no confirmed date of it coming back, what did this mean for the franchise? How would fans of this long-running staple keep the memory of Doctor Who alive, and how long would they have to wait before their hero made a true return to television screens? You'll have to join me next time to find out. Some of this danger. Some of this injustice. And somewhere else the tea's getting cold. Come on, Ace. We've got work to do. So those are the ratings details for the Seventh Doctor's entire era. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at the final years of the classic series, a time in which, even though viewing figures were rapidly declining, the creativity, imagination, and quality of most of the stories couldn't have been higher. All rounded off with yet another phenomenal Doctor in Sylvester McCoy, who shines throughout all of his three-year stint. If you want to watch more Doctor Who content, then I highly recommend that you check out the following creators. The Review of Death podcast, Kane Unable, and Dan Johnson, all of whom make fantastic content. If you want to read more about Doctor Who in the making of it, then I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you want to see new episodes of the series early, then you can by supporting us on Patreon or via my Ko-fi page. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on the Sylvester McCoy era in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we'll see you next time for the Wilderness Years.